Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order, the June 12, 2018 Central Vermont Internet Governing Board meeting. Um, let's do let's do introductions again. If we can go um, go all all the way around the, the table, just so we remember who all of us are. And there's some new faces there. So you want to you want to start? I'll start. I'm Jim Barlow. I'm the representative from Marshfield. I'm David Healy, the representative from Callis. I'm Alan Gilbert, the representative from Worcester. Bob Klein, representative from East Montpelier. Not to be outdone. Bob Burley from Elmore. Not to be outdone. Andrew Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're over here, we're over here bobbing. <laughs> Jeremy Hansen from Berlin. Mark Farley, alternate, but sitting in from Northfield. Robert Schneider from Williamstown. Rebecca Schneider, clerk. Chris Rennell, representative from Barry City. Michael Birnbaum, representative from Plainfield. Excellent. We have some alternates. You want to introduce yourselves? Tom Fisher, for, uh, alternate for East Mount Perry. Scott Message, alternate for Dallas. Ellie Bent, uh, alternate for Barry City. Okay. Welcome all. Um, any additions or changes to the agenda? <laughs> Hearing none. Public comments. We have ten minutes budgeted for public comments about any items that are not on not on the agenda. And this is board members or alternates opportunity to to weigh in on anything that we don't already have listed here. Okay. Just one. Sure. Is there a public lobbying for the Wi-Fi here? Um, so the answer is yes, but I don't have the password handy. Okay. There's, there's an unpassworded one that we have to go through a message that says this is not secure. But it is. Yeah. What's that? WCSU Wi-Fi. Okay, that's that's the oh, public one. Now. No yeah. password. Thank you. Give it a shot. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, not hearing any public comments. Um, report back about certificate of organization. Rebecca, I believe this was yours. Yes. Um, so, uh, the uh, what's required for uh, the, the communications um, district is a certification of the vote in the towns that voted on meeting day. That gets submitted to um, the Secretary of State's office and then they distribute the official notice to all the towns. So I don't know who received the certification of the vote. So that's a good question. Um, I, re I saw the, the votes, uh, the official votes on various town websites and in the newspaper, and then I contacted the select boards of all of the towns to um, have their representatives appointed. Um, so I don't know that I have anything certified from those towns, aside from just Jeremy. Can I have uh, I, I don't know if this uh, <coughs> follows under the same uh, set of rules as the town does, but whenever there's a town vote, the town clerk provides certification of the vote to the Secretary of State. I don't know if that's applicable there. And it, and it might be. I mean, they, they, sure. they, they probably already have, have reported the contents of their, you know, the results of their votes on, the, on their, not, not only their items that are candidates or budgets or whatever, but I would expect this as well. Um, I don't know um, if that's sufficient for the Secretary of State. We can, we can just say, hey, you know, there were these uh, 13 now towns that voted at town meeting in the affirmative. Here's the list. Um, we're good to go. I mean, as far as uh, what we need, I mean, I think I think everything was done properly. T's crossed, I's dotted, and such. Um, so maybe the best way forward is just to just to write a letter and just send it to the. Um, the secretary, you know, these towns did this. Mm -hmm. They should have reported this to you already, and we're good to go. Okay. That's been reasonable for everybody, too. Okay. Yeah, the person who is in charge of that process right now is new to it, so. <laughs> who, who, who is that? Uh, it's Rachel Muse. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and make it all the election results. Well, that's what I was thinking too. I said, "Well, don't you already have that?" Because it was part of the regular town meeting process, so they should already have that certification of those. So, um, but I'll just verify that and um, make sure that they've done everything they need to do. Okay. Yeah, because getting that clock started is, is 
apartment is a pretty good idea. Well, and it looked like from the website that the clock actually starts, like the date of those votes is the date that it starts, maybe not later. I, it says, I, I remember the statute said that it's from the date of the filing of the certificate of organization, that that's something that this board causes to happen. So that would have to have to happen after the board meets, and that we say we're going to file a certificate of organization as However, so we, in the last meeting, we, we chose the name under which to file, so we're essentially ready to, to pull the trigger. And I'm, I'm happy to do that, or if you just want to write a letter and say, this is us, we exist, mm -hmm. and then that triggers that, that statutory um, timer. Okay, yeah, it just looked like, from the website, it looked like for CUDs and a couple other entities, it was different, but I'll verify that. Okay. Could you two just stay in touch between our big meeting so that mm -hmm. our next big meeting is a done deal? Yeah, and, and, and that was something I would, you know, that we're hoping to have been, to then resolve. And we should have be able to say, as of June X, that this is resolved, and then our, our timer runs out in December, and then we can start we can start accepting money, open a bank account, and do all the, the more formal pieces. <laughs> You're not going to tell me on anywhere. Unlikely. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else on certificate of organization? Okay. Um, Michael Greenbaum, broadband primer presentation. So. Okay, so um, I need, um, I'm a broadband guy, but not an AV guy. Okay. That's so, I can help. Okay, we're set up, but we need to confirm it. <laughs>
So networks, we're all familiar with what networks are. But a digital communication network is this definition. You should read it for a second. Notice there's two ways to carry the digital information. One's electrical signals and the other's electromagnetic waves. We'll get into that. So the electromagnetic spectrum, is everyone familiar with that? It's um, a bit of a complex thing. It's physics, it's the waves. Some of them are visible as light, and some of them are x-rays, and some are radio, and some are microwaves. There are all these different frequencies of waves. So the, some of the waves are really short, and some of them are enormous. And the enormous ones have much lower frequencies because they take up much more space, and it takes more time to get that big wave through. And the smaller, smaller, smaller waves are very, very fast. And the usable spectrum for, say, wireless communication is, um, right in there, that's too small to read. So there, there's microwaves, which are up in here, and then there's a bunch of smaller, shorter waves in here. And you're familiar with shortwave radio, those are much longer waves. AM radio stations have waves that are bigger than this building. But uh, a microwave antenna, say, with a dish, is sending out waves that are this big. Okay, this is a definition to read. And we all pretty much have intuited that. So, the internet is a collection of, um, well, let's, let's start, well, let's think about web pages because they're the most familiar. So a web page is going to have an address, and that address is going to be a, a, in numbers. Typically, uh, internet protocol version four, this four, first group of four numbers, like that 172. And um, so every web page or every um, device on the internet, they all get assigned different IP addresses, internet protocol addresses. Um, and for the longest time, these groups of four octets, octets because you see the ones and zeros underneath, there's eight of them for each number. And each one represents the number above. That was more than adequate, but the internet exploded, and the uses of the internet exploded, and um, we've run out of those addresses. So IPv6, Internet Protocol version 6, was developed, and you can see, I think, yeah. Um, oh, this is what you need to see. So see how many addresses there are in IPv4, and this is how many are in the new one. Um, Generally speaking, IPv6 has not been generally very well adopted. Um, it's in use in all the major routers and all the major providers as kind of background, and it is carrying a lot of information, but largely IPv4 is still dominant, and there's a market now selling unused addresses to people who need them. So even though they've run out, it's still a fungible resource. So the internet isn't just the web, but we're kind of concentrating on that. Yes, Bob? Just to test my eyes a little bit, sure. uh, IPv6, that's done in hex, right? Uh, Hexadecimal? The, the I, I don't know. I think I saw hex. I, yeah. I, yeah. I was working down here in the mysterious right. call room. Do you want me to go back to this slide? No, no, sir. That, that's all I need to know. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the numbers are really long. Um, they're, they're divided up with colons instead of periods. and, and um, if there's many redundant ones, and so there's ways of shortening them. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elegant, complicated system. And it's going to be really valuable when the Internet of Things develops in its massive scale, when every household is going to need 100 or more addresses, and then we're going to start to use the capacity of that. 
so the web is the predominant tool, and um, I remember when Bob was talking about his background in digital equipment, he was talking about ARPANET and DARP, DARPANET. So that, that's back in 1969 when the internet was sort of invented, and um, 20 years later the web got more fully invented. And the key language, remember we were talking about languages, so hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, is the key language for the web. And HTML markup language also. So does everyone know what a domain is? So we have one? Do we have one yet? No, we don't have one yet. Domain name servers, these are crucial to the internet. These are the dictionary for the internet. Um, remember we were all IPv4, four numbers separated by three dots? Well, none of us can remember any of those numbers, but we can remember things like google.com. So a domain name server is a dictionary that translates between the name of a website and the actual numbers that underlie it. So when, if a DNS server isn't functioning and you have a perfect connection out to the internet, you will not get any web pages because the, the translation won't happen. Um, and, and domain name servers are decentralized. They're replicated all over the world. And every ISP has the ability to have its own or to subscribe to others that are larger and larger organizations. And the whole internet is very decentralized with some centralized organization. So there's little tiny networks like the Wi-Fi network in here. Here, sir. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> Welcome. Just grab a seat anywhere. Here, go there. Yeah, I haven't missed that much. So, the little Wi Fi network in the library that's a micronet, or you could say it. And then there's small, small local ones, perhaps the whole network in the school, or maybe the school systems network. And they get bigger and bigger, and they get centralized to regional places. And then there's national networks and international backbones. There's huge cables that go under the sea. There's all kinds of networks that connect the whole world. And, um, oh, I should, uh, I'll keep going, but here's a here's fiber optic cable. There's 72 pieces of glass in this one, 72 strands. So the ones that go under the sea are bundles of these things and the bundles are bigger than I can reach my arm around because there's so many strands going across. Would you maybe pass that around? Sure. Thanks. So each of those tubes, the colored tubes in, the, in there, holds 12 glass strands, which are also color-coded. Some of them have broken off because I've been hauling it around for a while. So, uh, I remember in our last meeting, the word broadband got disparaged. This is all it means. Um, it once meant something else, but this is what it's come to mean now. So there's lots of broadband services. We're familiar with data is, is like web stuff. And voice is telephone over the internet voice over internet protocol, video, you're familiar with that on YouTube and Netflix. There's security services brought over broadband, there's telemedicine, which is becoming more and more important. There's education, which has always been part of the web, but it's getting much more important with video and interconnecting schools. 
And then there's the Internet of Things, which is just in its nascence right now. That's smart light bulbs and smart refrigerators and smart toasters and all kinds of silly things. But there's a real lot of potential there, especially industrially. But as consumers, we're going to get to know, know them more. You know, a refrigerator is saying, you're low on milk, and we're not even going to tell you. I'm just ordering it for you because you're low on milk. Because everything's going to be connected if we choose to buy that stuff. You know, we don't have to. But that's where the world's headed. So how do, how are we doing on time? Should I speed up or? Um, I think now we're you're good. I'm on like fifteen of forty. Yeah, like twenty more minutes. Great. Okay. Um, so how is broadband measured? It's measured in bits per second. Remember, bits are <coughs> zeros and ones. It's measured in kilobits, which is thousands of them, megabits, which is millions of them, and gigabits, which is, is that billions? I think it's billions. Yeah. Transfer of data is measured differently. Remember, there were bits and ones and zeros, but then there were bytes, which were packets of eight bits. That's a byte. So data transfer is measured in kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and terabytes, and even bigger. Teraflops. <laughs> All kinds of stuff. So that, that's confusing when you look at a speed test, because sometimes a speed test will be categorized in bytes and sometimes in bits, and you'll say, oh, mine is really slow. It's this little number. But then you realize, oh, you have to multiply it times eight. It's not so bad. Or the reverse. Um, Delay and latency are really important measurements. Um, if you, well, let's say you're doing a stock trade, something I've never done, but let's say you are, and you want to get it at a certain price, and you send the signal, and your broadband connection has a lot of latency. Uh, by the time you get there, it might have gone up $2. Um, if you're playing a shoot up, shoot em up game, you might be killed before you even realize it, and you're still <laughs> shooting the other guy. So latency matters, it, matter, it affects uh, the quality of voice. That's a really important thing with voice. So if you want to do voice over internet protocol or telephony of any sort, um, if you have a lot of latency in your system, it's going to be poor. It's going to sound like it's underwater or, or you're going to talk over somebody because it didn't get back fast enough. So that's measured in um, milliseconds and microseconds. So jitter or packet delay variation, typically called jitter, is, is delay versus the average. So if it's varying all the time, that's, it's okay to have consistent delay. But if it varies all the time, that really messes up voice, for example. So jitter is a very important measurement as well. So this illustrates it. Can you all read that one? So this is showing that pretty much that was fairly steady, and so we can get away with a couple of drops of packets, a little bit of a little bit of latency. But if you have a lot of variation, that wouldn't be readable or curable. And, and you could almost add that as an additional bullet there in, with, in terms of data loss, like or the noise on the line. That could be another way, another way of mention, uh, Good measuring point. Good point. a particular link, so signal-to-noise ratio. It will be in the next presentation. Thank you. <laughs> sure. um, so now we're going to divide it up into wireline and wireless. Okay. So here are wireline delivery media. And I'll talk about that photograph in a second. So there's twisted pair copper. That is your regular telephone line. Two little skinny wires that are twisted together. And they're twisted together for a reason. It affects how the waves travel over them and, and uh, reject noise. Um, and there's coaxial copper, which is what you're familiar with for cable TV or just connecting your TV to something in your house, that's a heavy copper wire surrounded by a um, dielectric that doesn't conduct, and then there's a sheath of metal around that, and then it, um, actually, there should be pictures here. 
Well, maybe they show up later. Um, then there's optical fiber, which is passed around. Oh, you got the end. And so these, these wires can be buried, or they can be hung on poles, or strung through buildings. And outdoors, they're vulnerable to these, these hazards. The aerial is more ice storms and vehicles, possibly forest fires, and buried is very vulnerable to digging accidents. So wireline runs on different kinds of protocols, which I'm not going to try to define that. Someone want to? I don't think we need to get to that okay. depth here. All right. So twisted pair of copper, remember that's telephone? So these are telephone internet protocols. ADSL, that's asymmetrical digital signal line, I think. ADSL2 is a faster one. GFAST is, is a merging of multiple um, copper pairs to make to bring a little more speed. These are all technologies that the telephone companies deliver broadband with. Um, the cable companies use coaxial copper. And I, I do know what DOCSIS is, but I'm going to mess it up, so I'm not going to say it out loud. But DOCSIS 3 is what is the real fast one that, people, that the cable companies are now using. Um, then there's two kinds of fiber protocols. There's active Ethernet, which means it's point to point. At one end, you have a powered device that sends light over the fiber. And at the other end, you have a powered device that receives it. And it's a single piece of glass the whole way. And the fiber goes back and forth between those two points. That's active Ethernet. And then there's passive optical fiber, and that's GPON, XGSPON, and so forth. These involve, um, think of it as point to multipoint. There's a piece of glass, it gets um, spliced into a splitter, and now that piece of glass is divided into multiple pieces of glass, and those there's no power device there, it's just passive, and it goes on, and then finally each one terminates at a destin an end user. And you can even split further, you can cascade these splits. And the limitations are that every time you split it, you are cutting down the amount of light that can pass over it, so you can't just infinitely split. But it, it's a much more economical way to um, deploy fiber. There are, there are arguments for active Ethernet, but I'll, it's, it's more typical for the kind of thing that we're talking about to go with passive. <clears throat> and then, if you want to deliver um, a lot of bandwidth to a central point where you're then going to distribute it, you may need a lot more capacity than is available in the ponds, the passive optical networks. This is where, um, let's see, uh, coarse wave division multiplex, coarse wave division multiplex, dense wave division multiplex, and a new version of pond. Each of those carry, instead of one or ten gigs, they can carry multiples of ten gigs, hundred gigs, and more. And so that is a, a backhaul to the locations where you're then distributed. So those are the protocols, and we're going to get a little deeper into each of these now. That's, now I remember the pictures were here. So this is the phone lines. That, that's two phone lines there. So to get DSL at a house, you have to have, the phone company has to have installed it. DSL is distant dependent. It's a very important feature of it. If you are within 200, 300, 400 feet of the um, terminal, there's several kinds. There's central office ones and remote ones, and they're called DSLAMs and things like that. If you are within um, a short distance, you can get pretty good speed. You can get 20 megs. But the majority of the people on a DSL line can get more like 
seven or three or one and a half or three quarters, <laughs> and the farther away you go, the slower it gets because it's just the matter of physics. The cop, these little tiny copper wires can't carry speed that far out. And the way the phone company tries to solve that issue is to densify. They put in more and more terminals to try to boost it up again. But there are very clear limits to this technology. Um, that GFAST one I mentioned is, is one way around it for a little while. It buys some time for them, but the long range is not, and there's some, they're doing some bonding also. But in the long range, it's, it's a dead end technology. <clears throat> and all the phone companies, even though they're selling it, they know it. Even if you're close to a box, if you get more subscribers, the speed goes down? Uh, yes and no. Um, it, it is, they sometimes call it dedicated signal line. It isn't truly. But um, there is a limit to how many they will put on, on a stretch. And um, cable and wireless are more susceptible to oversubscription than DSL is. Um, but the other, and, but you will notice that at night when more people are using it, it's going to be slow. And the other thing you'll notice is that some, two houses next door to each other with the same distance to the terminal will have different qualities of service. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is the quality of the copper wires that it's coming across. If they're old Verizon copper wires that haven't been touched in 25, 30 years, they're they're corroded, they're, there's a little water leakage, they just, so the physical plant matters a lot. And copper is a very expensive commodity. And so to put up, to, to rebuild with more copper, and to know that it's kind of a dead end technology, tells the phone company, we don't want to do that. We don't want to invest in that because it's not in the long range. Therefore, the plants degrade and degrade and degrade. And so, if you have four lines coming into your house, you might want to keep changing them to see which one gives you the fastest speed, because it's actually that variable. So we've talked about the speeds, and I noticed the difference between downstream and upstream. That's very important. Upstream really matters. Most people don't think so, because they're downloading stuff. But without the communication up to the servers that are downloading to you, it doesn't work smoothly and doesn't work as quickly. And if you want to send a, an architectural drawing, it's a big file and it's going to take a long time with, with limited upstream. And phone lines are limited that way. And we just talked about that. So we'll talk about cable now. So those, that's a familiar looking cable, right? More speed. Pretty significant downstream. Pretty limited upstream. Why? Because it was designed around TV. It was designed as a <coughs> delivery mechanism, not a two -way. <coughs> So the protocols don't allow for it as much. And the construction of the cable, one would do it. Now this DOCSIS 3 is getting around that to a certain extent. Um, the cable providers are formidable competitors for fiber providers, so I'm not denigrating their service compared to DSL. They, they deliver good service. Um, if they're in terms of customer service, that's another story. <laughs> but in terms of um, technically, they can deliver pretty good service. Um, this was an answer to Alan's question. There's shared network segments on um, coaxials, so more customers, slower speeds. And it is capable of VoIP. There's uh, enough limit to the jitter that it, it'll, VoIP will work pretty well on it. So we're now we're going to talk about fiber. So these speeds are dramatically greater than the previous one. So what's carrying, those, what's carrying all that information down the glass fiber is a wave of light, multiple waves of light, zillions of waves of light. And on those waves of light are digital pulses and 
I'm not going to go farther than that, just to say that there's information being carried on the waves of light down the glass. And the waves of light will go, uh, imagine you're in a dark hall and you turn on a flashlight and you shine it on the wall at the opposite end and you see a beam on the thing. Now imagine you're in a castle and you shine your flashlight and you look down at the other end of the castle and you can't see the beam on that wall because it's gone so far, it's gotten weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So that's what happens on fiber. The light, there's a budget. There's only so much light created by the laser that's injecting the digital information on the glass. And as it goes farther and farther, it gets dimmer and dimmer. And at a certain point, it cuts off. It just There's not enough digital information to work. And so the fiber optic engineers design that. They figure out the safe margin of where to stop. They figure out how many splits were in there, how much to, to get diminished by splits, how much distance is involved. And the reason it diminishes, I mean, light will travel forever, right? If it's in a vacuum in outer space, it just keeps going. But we're not there. We're here, and it's going around bends. It's reflect, reflecting and refracting off of the inner cladding of the cable. And um, there's friction and, and um, occlusion to the, the quality of the glass and so forth. And so it, it has a fin finite um, budget. So I already told you about active Ethernet being point to point. And the passive, those ponds, typically they're split 16 or 32 times, sometimes 64. And it all depends on how much how much um, light you start with and how much bandwidth you start with, what you want to deliver to customers and how far you want to go. So let's say you're starting with a gigabit of speed at one end. If you divide it by 64, you may not be able to deliver all the bandwidth that everybody wants, all 64 customers, especially in the long run, when they all want maximum. So you might want to limit it to 32 splits and so forth. <clears throat> so, remember we were talking about the backhaul stuff, the, the wave division multiplex, either coarse wave or dense wave. So coarse wave is typically four colors and dense wave can be up to 64. Those are, so you have light waves going over this little thin strand of glass. You saw how tiny those are. Each, that strand of glass can carry a light wave but it also can carry another light wave, and another one, and another one, all different frequencies, and they don't interfere with each other. As long as they're different, they can travel simultaneously down that glass, which exponentially increases the amount of information that can be carried on that glass, and that's why those are the backhaul protocols, because they can deliver so much to each central point. So how's wireless different from wireline? Did you all get to read this cartoon? It's near and dear to my heart because I'm a wireless ISP provider, right? And everyone talks about how it's so simple. And, well, I'll tell you, here's the line. It's actually more challenging than wireline is. Um, there's, there's, a lot more, um, there's a lot more physics, there's a lot more um, I'll give you an example. There was a French physicist named Pascal Fresnel. You may have heard of him. You may have seen a Fresnel lens with lots of concentric circles carved in a piece of plastic, and you look at it, and it magnifies. And anyhow, he, he did a lot of optical um, physics. And he figured out that radio waves don't travel from one point to another point with just directly with a single line. In fact, they travel in an ellipsoid shape. So in the midpoint between the two points, it's an enormous fat part of the football. And so he figured out that that's why radio waves, um, even though you can see from this point to that point, might, it might not get there because the lower part of the zone is getting interfered by hills and trees. And so we now, in wireless, pay a lot of attention to all the Fresnel zones 
and make sure that we have things aimed so that the lower part of the funnel is can be interfered with. That's an example of one of the things that makes wireless challenging. Um, not that it's bad, it's just takes more figuring out. Five minutes left? What are we on? 21, we're halfway. <laughs> I can, I can make mine a little bit shorter, but that probably right. buys you another five minutes. Okay, so I just told you that. We're done with that. Main wireless delivery types. So there's terrestrial fixed. That's fixed antenna on a building, earth-based. Terrestrial mobile. That's what you think of as cellular. Satellite fixed. Fixed big fat antenna on your house. Satellite way up there. Satellite mobile. That's sat phones that the war correspondents use in Afghanistan, right? And then there's middle atmosphere fixed and mobile, and we're going to see more about these. So here are protocols for wireless. You're familiar with some of these, and less so with some of these other ones. And I won't describe them because we're short on time. Um, so, typical wireless ISPs use low power, unlicensed, <clears throat> shared spectrum. Here are some of the schemes. You're familiar with Wi-Fi, which is designed to be indoors. There's proprietary schemes that developed a way to do Wi-Fi outdoors and not have too many packets colliding in the air between points, but didn't fully solve it until the fourth generation, which were WiMAX and LTE, which were designed, truly designed for outdoor wireless and big breakthroughs. <clears throat> Um, typically, because of low power, you use high gain antennas to receive the weak signal. Um, wireless, uh, wireless is void capable, um, typically um, not with the cellular, but with the fixed wireless. Um, companies don't cap how much transfer you're doing in a month, so you don't have budgets. Oh, I ran out, I can't see any more movies now. Um, and wireless, unlike DSL, continues to advance. There's, we haven't reached anywhere close to the limits of physics in terms of how much information can be carried on wireless. And so there are now um, radios capable of um, greater than some typical fiber installations. You know, gig, multi gigabits going over wireless. Slightly um, shorter distances, though for the faster links. Some of them are and some of them aren't, yeah. Um, and there's, a, there's great ways of combining the two. Um, the weak point in any wireless chain is the, the access point or base station, the radio that is disseminating to everyone. That has a finite capacity. If you exceed it, you have to put another one on the tower with another set of antennas. Um, whereas with wireline, the, the, the weak point was just uh, with DSL. The weak point was distance. With um, fiber, once again, there's distance and splitting. Everything has break points. So now mobile. They use high power, and it's licensed. And the reason they can use high power is they're the only ones on that particular frequency, so they're not interfering with anyone else. Whereas the wireless ISPs are on. Shared spectrum, it's all low power so they can get along with each other without too much interference with each other. Um, the range is a little shorter, and, but it, because of the high gain broadcasting, they can use low gain handsets. And they severely restrict transfer. You have to pay a lot for that transfer. That gets to be an expensive way to get broadband. These are different. Um, FGs stand for generation, not gigabit. Second generation, third generation, fourth generation. They've gobbled up all the spectrum there is. And they want more. And they're very greedy, those cell carriers. Um, there just isn't enough spectrum to do all the things they want to do. So they're. You're fighting at the FCC level to, to get reclassification of government spectrum and take it away from WISPs and all kinds of stuff. So that's, that's their big currency, their spectrum. Satellite, that's the problem. 
very high latency because you, you, you say, I want to go to Google.com. The signal goes up to the satellite, it goes down to Texas, because that's where they translate everything. Back up to the satellite, Google sends back to you. So that's 22,236, that's 44,472 miles round trip. It's actually double that. So 89,000 miles of distance. It's going at the speed of light. But that's a long way to go at the speed of light, and so that represents just under a second of latency. And that's why VoIP won't work on satellite. Not well. <laughs> yeah. And because the package up there orbiting the Earth is limited by weight, it has limited capacity, just like the radios on the tower were limited. But you can't just throw another one on the tower if it's up there. You have to launch another that's millions of dollars. So they limit packages to the customers. And that's how they do it. They call it fair use. If you can see the southern sky, you can see one of those satellites and you can get service. So it's the last resort. It, it's, it's one way to get a form of broadband where no one else can get to you. But you may have to kill a lot of trees down or stick it way high in the tree. So we'll do the sat phones really quickly. Same thing. There are low Earth orbit ones. that They're only 700 miles. They work much better. But you need lots of satellites because they're not geostationary. They're new. <coughs> and then this is some of the future. They seem kind of low tech and old, but they're actually kind of cool. And for the con continent of Africa, it might be great. For all of Nevada, it might be great. For places where there's vast spaces and maybe not a lot of economic um, support, these kinds of solutions may be very good ones. And I've toyed with doing the blimp thing for Vermont for years, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> So, an internet service provider is an organization offering communication services. And backhaul, we started to talk about fiber backhaul. It's the way to connect different sites that an ISP has. It's sometimes called backbone. Uh, T1 is an old, old cell phone link that we used to think was really, 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 really fast. It was 1.5 megabits per second. Uh, microwave. Is, um, it, a microwave doesn't necessarily have to be a big dish. We think of these things as microwave antennas. Microwave is just referring to the frequency of the radio waves that are um, propagating from an antenna, which could be square and small. Uh, millimeter wireless links, these are the ones that Jeremy was just alluding to. They're short distance, ultra high speed connections. And then there's fiber links. These are all different kinds of backhaul. And they're important because everything fails sometime. And redundancy matters. So can, can we can we cherry pick the remaining slides? Because we're uh, Yeah. Should I not talk and just flip through them? Um, no, I just, I just continue talking. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Um, so to, to run an ISP, you can't just have a delivery meeting. You have to have a lot of other stuff, and this is important to us. This is the business of running an ISP. All of these functions. Without any of these functions, without any one of these functions gone, and the ISP doesn't work, fails. So remember, this was a presentation for Craftsbury. So this only shows the ISPs they could have chosen from. Uh, some of you may know about uh, a WISP called Great Off Wireless or GAW. It was in the news for years. 
it was statewide, pretty controversial. Um, what's left of that list is NUCO. And you all know who Vito Wireless is. They have a strange combination of cellular and fixed. Um, it's not truly cellular in terms of phone because they don't have agreements to, to roam, and it's not truly WISP because they're using uh, mobile technology to deliver their fixed service. So they're an unusual. <coughs> and then this was the ones that we, uh, we were offering to bring um, to Craftsbury, and it's like Kingdom by Your Wings. Um, so this shows, that, and we can we can um, translate this for our region. So see, there's um, that blue line is state fiber. It's already there, and I mentioned the roads that it was on. Um, so we're, when we do our mapping module, we're going to figure out what resources already exist, and where are the where are the weak points, and all that. Mapping is really essential. What do you mean by state fiber and dark fiber? Um, why don't we save that for later? It's a good question, and but it'll. Okay. Okay. Um, so, how is mobile wireless um, like fixed wireless? It, they use the same kind of stuff. Um, when, when you say cellular, that really doesn't mean mobile wireless. Fixed wireless is also cellular. If there's a central thing in this hub and spoke system, there's a cell and another cell and another cell. Um, so they use pretty much the same design. Um, the mobile carriers connect with the analog phone network. That's a difference. And here's the significant difference. Handoffs goes from one cell to the next seamlessly. It doesn't, you don't have to reconnect to a different Wi-Fi spot, right? You, you're driving down the interstate. If there's enough towers, you don't lose your phone call. It keeps going. So that's handoffs. That's something fixed wireless doesn't do. It doesn't need to because you're not moving. Um, but that's the difference. And the handsets are very proprietary. Um, so, these are the different kinds of wireless base stations. There's macro cells, which are the big ones that are on towers. And then there's small cells, various sizes. Uh, the femto cells are the ones you stick inside your house to increase your cellular range right in the house. Um, and the, the micro cells, or the, actually, the, I would say the pico cells are the ones that Coverage Co. are using. They, they have, no, oh no, they're bigger than that. They're microcells, but they don't have two kilometer range, so they're microcells. Oh, and then there are boosters, which is something different. A booster just finds a signal and amplifies it and spreads it through. Um, so these are the providers that could get to uh, Craftsbury. Oh, we got, we've come to the end, guys. So, um, and we also might want to do some kind of analysis of all the economic relationships of each of these technologies. How, what's the cost benefit of wireless versus fiber versus everything else? And um, also compare the providers and think of where we're going to fit in there. And how long is it going to take? So then, these are the things we covered. Any questions come up from any of us yet? Or further ones? Do you have any, uh, there seems to be a friction in Vermont to towers. It comes and goes, it varies by town. Um, it depends on whether you're going through local zoning in Act 250 or whether you're going through a public service board or now it's called the Public Utility Commission process. Yeah. Um, it depends on how you approach the community. It depends on whether you're the big bad corporation or whether you're local and bringing something that the community wants. There certainly is friction in, in Vermont um, because Vermont doesn't want to look like New Jersey. Right. But on the other hand, most towns want 
more communication. <laughs> and usually it can be worked out if you're sensitive and appropriate. So we have never encountered resistance to a single tower we put out when we pull up the We're a very small risk. Um, whereas we put, there was one in Hardwick put up by Carl Linker from Barry. It took him three years and $150,000 in litigation to finally wear down the opposition and get it in. And we put ours up uh, a mile away from there um, in four or five months with no opposition. So it's a, maybe we were lucky in that case, I don't know, but um, that's the key is, is how you present it. So, did you all see the funny part? That's it. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Actually, leave that computer open because I'm going to. Oh, you want to use this one? Sure. Yeah. Okay. You want to put a thumb drive on it? Yeah. Okay. Um, if anybody who, um, <coughs> hasn't signed into this yet, which you probably still need to sign if you could pass that down. To briefly go over what EC Fiber presented to me, I'm not going to do as good of a job as, as they would. Um, it turns out that the reason that we meet the second Tuesday of the month is because in the statute that they wrote, they meet the second Tuesday of the month. So they're having a meeting right now, and it's going to be incredibly hard for them to get to our meetings unless we have a special meeting at some other time. Um, that said, I'm going to do my best to, to go through this, and I think Phil, where would you go, Phil? He was here. Okay. Um, Phil saw this presentation too and could probably um, weigh in a little bit, but I'm just going to blast through this reasonably quickly. Um, so there's, uh, there's their full name um, and there's, there's their mission. I have a, a short presentation after this too that sort of distills what I took from this and the way that I was pitching this. <clears throat> To the various communities as I went around Central Vermont, uh, end of last year, beginning of this year. So EC Fiber essentially pioneered the communications union district model in, in Vermont. Um, they are a public-private partnership. It's actually their operator, the company that runs the day-to-day -day operational bits and pieces, is a nonprofit. It's a formerly a dial-up internet service provider called Valorant, <coughs> and they do all of the heavy lifting. EC Fiber itself is, is a board, and they write checks to ValleyNet to go and operate the EC Fiber Internet Service Provider. Um, and they are a fiber to the premises network. That is, they install fiber primarily on, uh, on poles, existing poles, and they run fiber directly to the premises, businesses, and uh, individual residences. Um, and there's their towns and cities, um, and, as you, and I have a, another um, another map coming up soon, but uh, to, sh to show you, um, we actually abut their service territory, Williamstown and Roxbury here, and we have the opportunity to uh, interconnect with them if we choose to do so, and add some, some nice redundancy to their network, and add some nice redundancy to our network once we get, get connected down that far. I would, I would think so, and then connect to the north too with, with other, other folks that are around. <clears throat> so, let's see. so um, this was a long, long process for them to get to where they are. So there's uh, quite a lot of history here. Um, 
they had a bunch of angry people in very rural areas essentially stomping their feet and saying, why can't we have some? Why can't we have anything? And they, um, so they essentially ended up going through this whole process and they, they built their own, essentially. So they were mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. So they went and created something that was called a, I think they actually mentions this later, an intralocal contract. It's a slightly different thing than the, um, than the communications union district they are now, but they were having trouble getting funding in that structure. So they ended up sponsor, you know, getting somebody to sponsor legislation to create this structure that we're now taking advantage of here. Interlocal compact, thank you. So, um, wants high speed internet needs more than six people per mile on the road. So, that's that's the joke because the, the commercial providers wanted higher density. Higher density means profit. And when you're a municipality and your job is just to provide the service, you don't have to seek profits necessarily. I mean, you have to pay your bills and you have to provide the service, but you don't have to look at paying shareholders. So um, this number has actually increased since um, since they presented this, but they have about 420 miles of fiber run, and, uh, I th and I think they actually have built out to 600 and actually a little bit more than that um, since this is here. Um, so they have a, a little more than 2,000 subscribers right now, and that's a take rate of about um, 50 percent. That is, of the people that they their fiber runs by, half of those houses, half of those structures sign up, which is pretty great take rate compared to other places of, around the country. Um, and so their revenue averaged um, across all of their customers, some of whom are taking cheaper, um, cheaper subscription packages, some of whom are taking more expensive packages. They're, um, they average to about a, a $100 per customer to, per month. They have 14 full-time employees. Um, and after their fourth year of operations, they have their a positive EBT, EBITDA cash flow, essentially. So they have more than enough money to cover their expenses and are socking some money away and can actually pay off some of their, their debt early and can actually invest in additional, um, in additional builds if they, if they choose to do that. Jeremy, do you, uh, they've got a positive EBT, EBITDA now. Do you have any idea? when they hit that point in terms of the startup? Um, so if, if you don't know, don't worry about it. Just in, in doing startups before, EBITDA or time to profitability or time to break even are critical marketing things four years. to get investors. So they're four years and, that, and they hit that. Um, okay, so EBITDA in four years. Thank yes. Um, however, it's a little bit more complicated than that because they sort of meandered through various structures and, before they got there, but I think they're measuring from when they started operations, not when they started, you know, shaking down select boards. Yeah, to support. Continue. I'm kind of jumping ahead to okay. figure out. Okay, when the time comes to go uh, tin cupping, we're going to want to those. We're going to want to know that stuff. And, and and Michael's right. If you measure from the from the point where they started. Doing something, not when they started operations. It's more like seven years. Yeah, yeah that, that's about right because accumulative cash flow is an excellent way to manage a business, <laughs> and you expect a huge bathtub early on. Mm -hmm. And and part of that had to do with their ability to access capital. So, um, funding limitations. Uh, this is something that they um, that they got around by creating the communications union district structure, but. This is not something that tax money can be used to fund. You know, the, the, the promise that I went to all the select boards and to all of you with was that we're not going to use tax money. That we, you know, the, the funding for this network will come from the subscribers themselves. And EC Fiber has shown that this model can work. Um, so this strong track record, this here comes from them essentially crowdfunding and they mentioned this, um, uh, where is it? Yeah, crowdfunding um, a lot of their initial building and essentially asking people to give them uh, reasonably high interest rate loans. Um, we did that. That's something we did. Um, so here, this is the, the juicy bit. So 
2008 to 2011, so uh, ValleyNet actually paid in a, a bit to this as well. Uh, crowd financing, they got about $7 million in people giving them, um, giving them money and giving them loans. Um, and then they used that to do their initial build. And that initial build um, didn't, I don't think that was cash flow positive, but what it did is it showed is it showed future investors in step three there, the institutional investment showed them that they were capable of operating the internet service provider and that it was, um, it was they were going to be able to pay the money back that they borrowed. So as I understand it, the, the bond bank, you can't really go up for a municipal bond, a revenue bond, without two years of audited financials. So that's something that we have to keep in mind however we go about this as a communications union district. We'll have to do essentially two years of flailing about, flailing around a bit on our own. And that comes into play in my, my vision, um, uh, vision slides that are coming up here too. Um, fundraising history. And I don't think they've gone back for more of this, but I think the, their intent is to um, to go back for an, another round once they finish their, their current um, current waves of um, construction. What generally say institutional is bond bank or um, bond bank, yeah. Bond bank or direct direct bond. to bonds direct you know, bond gi gi given by certain banks. Um, so crowd crowd financing, so seven million dollars raised. Um, there were some really um, high-end loans given out, or really high-amount loans given out. So you might have somebody who's really wanted to see this happen, and they, you know, they said, "Here's two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars," and it'd be nice if we could find people like that too, because that makes things a lot easier. It's the paperwork, which they talked about, the paperwork for dealing with four hundred and fifty investors that you're paying them back on a loan, right? It's like paying paying back four hundred and fifty credit cards at a time. Um, so they had an 18-month holiday, and they said if they could do it again, they would make that holiday longer because they just barely got started, and then they had to start ramping up a whole bunch of people to take care of that paperwork. And they said they spent a lot of time and a lot of money just paying people back. And so um, that was building the bridge to real financing. Hey, me, yeah. Quick on that holiday they took on the payment center. Did they give a number of how long they thought would be more optimal? I have that written down somewhere. I don't have that here in my pocket, but I think at least, I would imagine at least two years. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's um, you know, for people who want to see the project go forward and who want to earn you know, a decent interest rate on something like this, I mean, it's, it's a promissory note, so it's unsecured. So people have to have faith that, that this is going to actually work. Um, but because this is a, a, a municipality, you know, we're all going to be above board and transparent, and they'll know at each step of the way what it is that we're doing. And they can come to these meetings and have a say in it. It's rather different than, you know, a, a startup that doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be totally transparent. Just, um, just, just a observation in passing, anticipated just some general obligation debts in at about that time frame. And this interest is at a slight premium to what the GO debt uh, out of the Vermont Bond Bank and stuff was paying. So, <coughs> sure, back to pay a slightly high interest rate. Sure, and this, I mean, this is and this is unsecured too. So yeah. these folks would not be able to come back and you know and take you to court and you know sue you and take over the assets that are being, being built with this. <coughs> so, um, so this was nice, and they, but they talked about um, the administrative burden down at the bottom, and there's and there's more <coughs> more here too. But I'm just going to sort of um, scoot over quickly. Um, and then, so then what they did is rather than marketing to individual neighborhoods or bit, you know one person here, one person there, they found that it was easier to market to entire towns, saying we're going to turn on all of Roxbury or whatever, and that's easier to find you know find people to um, to sign up for that. So what they did is, when they took out their first round of bonds, they used a good portion of that to actually pay pay off early that uh, that crowd financing. 
because they got a much better rate from the bond bank and they were able to, to save some money there. And at the same time, they were able to do, what's that? Simplify the admin. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So you, so you take you know, your, you know, your 250 people who, who all put in you know, $500 and you wipe that administrative burden off your books and then use the remaining money to, to, build, out, um, you know, to build out the additional network. The twenty five hundred buy in for their promissory notes. Yeah. Okay, that so that it would be something like that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there are some of their plans, and this is really hard to see. Um, um, they did get pulled down some grants um, from the state of Vermont. Um, they were able to use dark fiber, and dark fiber is essentially they have fiber optic cables running on the poles or running somewhere that's not being used. And so VTA, the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, built these with the you know, expecting that other people would use this. And you can essentially pay rent to use their fiber that's already there. We don't have any of that in Washington County that we can use. Is that because the company's won't that No. Uh, so uh, th there's no dark fiber offered by the state of Vermont. Oh, no dark fiber, but proprietary or company owned fiber there is. Okay. Yeah. And so. They won't rent that. Probably not. I mean, they will. What's that? They, they will. Okay. So, but that's that's something that we would need to explore depending on where we. Two different. Present. Dark is was sort of like publicly dropped in, sort so, of. So that's a that's a, a slightly different slightly different term. Uh, the op open access. So when when that's available to anybody to use, otherwise you're talking about ne negotiating access to, to those other other links. So can this work elsewhere? And the. You know, I was banking as I was going and pitching this to the select boards and city councils that that it would that this would work here in Central Vermont. We could duplicate their their successes here. Um, requires uh, lead in local investors, no risk to the town, angry and determined communities. I know that there are several of those here in in Washington County. Um, there are grants available from the state um, that we need to um, pursue. Willing service provider and operations company. That's something, that's a nut that we still have to crack. Um, dedicated volunteers, uh, governance, marketing, sales, patients. That's you all. <coughs> this requires a lot of work. Go where the unmet need is the highest. And this was sort of, this was Herb's, uh, Herb Tomei's um, kind of pitch to, to us before there was a communications union district. He's, th these are the things he was telling us. Go where the un unmet need is the greatest. So in, 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 my, in my vision, that's where only DSL is available. So I'm looking at you, Roxbury. Um, small businesses, especially people who are working out of their homes, <clears throat> major employers who might want a, might want a bump or other you know, municipal entities that want better service, um, school districts, for example. You know, um, WCSU, I think only East Montpelier and Berlin of the um, elementary schools have anything like high-speed internet. I think like up in up in Worcester, it's just the DSL line to serve the whole school. Jeremy, this is Dan Jones. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. So Dan Jones is going to be joining us uh, Remotely, because he wanted to be in on the later on this conversation about policy, but we'll get to that in a bit. I'm just going to put him right in the middle. Hey, Dan, can you hear me? I can. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You are on a chair in the middle of the room, and I'm uh, finishing up my presentation. Okay, great. Um, okay, and then so the other thing that he was pitching was he said, you know, offer the maximum um, maximum package to libraries and other community centers at the lowest, whatever the lowest tier um, that you can. He said that kind of engenders a lot of goodwill in the community. So they offer to libraries, they offer 700 megabit per second symmetric service for $66 a month, <laughs> which 
um, the libraries and schools look at that and they say, oh yes, oh yes, please. Um, and again, getting, getting more people to, to recognize this as a community service rather than as a, you know, um, somebody to, to fight with, I think this is, that's, um, that's something that you were alluding to before. Working with communities and helping communities to provide those necessary services is an important step to what we're, we're trying to do here. And so that is that, is that one. I'm going to go quickly go through my vision um, presentation here as well. So this is um, bits and pieces. If you've seen this presentation before, it's um, the one that I gave to the select boards or whatever. This is similar, but I have added a couple of other things here. So um, what I'm proposing is, um, in particular, fiber to the premises in the um, underserved areas in central Vermont. So current FCC rules call broadband 25-3, so 25 download, 3 upload, and these rules are changing. Um, not that many people actually have that. Um, it's mostly, in central Vermont, it's mostly concentrated in um, Montpelier, Berry City, Berry Town, and other denser places in some towns. Uh, you can get cable, like Comcast, here, and, and in some parts of Berlin, but not, not everywhere. Um, not down by you know, Mark in Northfield, not even me, I'm only a mile away from, from this building and it's not, it's not available where I am. And I would imagine that most of you also don't have um, the ability to get cable service. This, so you're in Barry City, you, you have access. Does anybody else have access to Comcast? Any of the other board members in this room? Or yeah. Charter. What's that? Charter. 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 Yeah. Worcester does have it. It comes up uh, through 12 and sort of goes to the village and has a few. Like part of part of like West Hill Road, like halfway up or and something. It comes over to Maple Corner. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Lucky you. It cover, Comcast covers pretty much all of Montpelier. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. All of Montpelier, all of Barry City, and like all but two addresses in Barry Town, I think. And Much so, of Middlesex. Charter. Yes. Uh, <coughs> charter. charter. Okay. So, um, Vermont Telecommunications Plan, um, which is, um, I would say, rather aspirational and being charitable said by the end of 2020, a majority of addresses in Vermont should have access at 100 megabits symmetric. Not gonna happen. Yes, oh. it will. <laughs> okay. It's the law, it's not aspirational, it's the law. Okay. Yeah. So, the, the, the law might say that, you know, pigs, <laughs> pigs ought to fly in 2024, you know, unless we're inventing, you know, pig. It depends on how well we write a plan and how quickly we write a plan. I like the way you think. <laughs> Um, then by 2024, it says every address should have at least 100 megabits per second. Um, so there is, you know, at, at the state level, there is a desire to make this happen properly. So, you know, getting the state to put their money where their mouth is, I think, is one of the things that's incumbent on us to, to push. Um, this is some of the data that's available on what's um, on access. This is Northfield. Um, the red lines, it might be hard to see, the red lines are where there is uh, at least 25.3, so these are uh, cable, and in Northfield it's uh, Transvideo. Everywhere else that's black though, like we have Mark's house down towards, the, down towards the bottom there, where it's black, that's only DSL access. So if you see and Berlin Pond up in Berlin, that's near where I live, nothing there either. So we know reasonably well where the um, you know where the cable is and where the cable stops, and I and maps for I think all of the member towns uh, are in the Google Drive. You can go see those. I created those using the using the data from the state. I think it's useful to get a geographical <coughs> grip on where we might be building. Um, so why do this? I think you're all here because you know we have to do this. So ISPs don't really have the motivation to build. Um, something that uh, Michael alluded to earlier, um, it's expensive to do anything other than you know, use the existing copper wires that are there. It requires a big investment and an uncertain payout. Um, having local governance, us here, local control, local accountability, local tech support is extremely attractive to everybody that I've talked to. Because we don't have to seek a profit, because we 
can seek municipal bonding, we can potentially offer cheaper rates at lower densities than a commercial entity might be able to. We can also emphasize net neutrality and subscriber privacy concerns. Um, but I think this is a big win for economic development, however, however you look at it. So I um, just want to give you a sense of the, of the map of where we are here. I created this before um, I created this before town meeting and Elmore was still kind of a question mark, so I circled it in green right there. And so we passed the town meeting ballot and all those towns were still waiting for Barrytown to send us a rep, but that should be imminent. Yeah, Cabot's not there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so uh, Cabot was added by us <coughs> later on. So Cabot was added. Orange and Moortown are interested. Moortown, I think, is going to put it on their ballot in November to do a kind of a temperature check on their population there. The select board didn't want to, didn't want a petition to join for whatever reason. Um, the select board in Orange has seen it and they're interested. I don't know where that is right now. Um, Brookfield, Braintree, and Granville, you can see bits of those down there. Um, those are EC fiber territories and those are places where we can you know, conceivably uh, interconnect with them either via Williamstown or via Roxbury. I think that's, um, Williamstown and Roxbury in particular are important towns because the, the infrastructure is essentially just going to be right over that, you know, right over that town boundary. Woodbury was I haven't heard anything more from Woodbury. There was somebody, um, somebody from Woodbury said, hey, this would be cool, and I said, put this in front of your select board. Um, if somebody wants to just, you know, float, um, float something to people they know in Woodbury, I don't really know anybody there. Yeah, the fire chief was at the meeting I was at just before, and he's very interested because this could support their radio communications. Just tell them to put in front of the select board and have them petition. That's, that's but we should also pursue Waterbury because of the population density. That could be a good funding source for them. Um, and Waterbury, as, as I recall, also has a, a fair bit of cable infrastructure there as well. But no, but also Waterbury is important to get up to some parts of Elmore. And this is something that Bob and I had a conversation about. So Waterbury, uh, Stowe, and then um, up into the, the Morrisville. Thank you. I would explore the share of fire department. Okay. okay. So that would be. I, I've explored uh, this proposition with uh, several select persons, as well as the town planners in Stowe, and they're quite receptive. There are some private suppliers there, but they don't see any conflict or any reason not to proceed. Great. Yeah, so if any of you feel like reaching out to uh, other uh, adjoining towns where it makes sense, um, I would encourage you just to go and, and ask them. And if they want a presentation, if they want somebody to come speak, I can, I can do that, or I can give you a slide deck that I presented, or I can give you, you know, the, the video recording that I recorded for Berlin. That would be fine, too. I think it's... Oh, 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 hold, hold on a second. This may be sort of a... Uh, adjacent question, but obviously the towns don't have to be adjacent, uh, joining because of Montpelier being part of the EC Fiber Union. What would be a benefit, or is there a benefit, or is there any reason to speculate or think about another town or other towns that might not be, you know, abutting the current towns? So, uh, some of these towns are um, even more underserved than the than the Washington County towns that we have here, and some of the I mean, Orange and uh, Memorial County towns as well. Um, and they might conceivably be, conceivably be better places to start or to do some initial building. Um, and there's also some um, you know, geographical access considerations, like you know, there might be corners of Plainfield, for example, that might be easier to reach via Orange. And if we're building in Orange already, it might make sense to offer those services there as well. Uh, I think it's important, and it's probably another agenda item for another meeting, that we temper our creation of expectations. What we really have to offer right now is planning services, because to figure out where the infrastructure is, where the dead zones are, where what problems we can solve near term, and what scale of dollars we're talking about long term, it's important not to run around and recruit more towns with unrealistic expectations. Sure. And so in, in, in particular, I, I, I agree with that. Um, it, where it makes sense, and, and this is something that we can, um, 
this is something that we can discuss, and we don't, you know, if, let's say, you know, um, Rotten just says, you know, uh, we want to come on board too. If we don't think that it makes sense, we can say no. We can say, why don't you hold off until we have more of an infrastructure? I think it's a, it's a valid point. Um, on the other hand, I think Waterbury, Stowe, Morristown makes eminent sense, especially when we're talking about serving um, Elmore, a large portion of which is really only going to be accessible via that sort of roundabout route. Okay, so this is my vision. This is um, sort of what I, what I was pitching to select boards and I sort of had this a bit more concrete in my mind. Again, the decision for how we're going to do things lies with all of you. Um, I would prefer to target communities that have DSL as their only non-wireless option. And that was taking the advice of Irv and EC Fiber. Um, the minimum density for it to financially make sense, this is something that I've said over and over in the media and I've said to the select boards, six subscribers per mile or fiber to the premises, it, it can work. It can work and be financially sensible. Um, I, I noticed here the bundling of TV. I think in a way we can, that, that's almost one that we can ignore because a lot of people are starting to move away from those bundled cable TV and that, offerings. And, and, so it, and that was something that I wanted to address specifically because one of the things that people do ask, when I was off like knocking on doors in Northfield to get this on the ballot there, that was something that people ask, asked about. That was something that I talked to one-on-one -on -one with uh, Jerry Diamantides about. He said, you know, what about bundling? And I said, if, you, if you're only going to DSL subscribers, this is that's less of a big deal. So when you go and try to compete with cable, that that becomes a harder proposition. Um, when you say six subscribers per mile, is that at a certain average level of subscription, or no? That's actually getting six subscribers per mile. That's not six. So it doesn't matter what whether they go for the base rate or they want to go for the. Um, mm -hmm. No, I mean, so I, I think you have to target the uh, roughly the same average. Some people will take more, some people will take less. But I think EC Fiber's numbers and the numbers that I, I saw from the from the state, um, it ends up averaging out to about $100 per subscriber, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, ultimately there's some dollar value per mile that we're really trying to hit. Yes, uh, it's $30,000 30, $30, per mile. Is I'm sorry, Dan, could you say that again? Per subscriber was $100. Um, so the, the, the cost, uh, as I understand it, the cost per mile is about $30,000. And that's to and that's to um, and that's kind of building in the office and the operation of bits and pieces too. So when you take so I would have to sit down with the spreadsheet again and take that thirty thousand dollars per mile divided among you know uh, six subscribers per mile and then work out how that amortizes. I think it just amortizes them over five years. If I'm not mistaken. And you said a fifty percent uptake, so that's twelve people on average. Right, and th and that's the and that's the trick. So if we have twelve, so and, but but that's that's still pretty optimistic, I think. If you have twelve structures per mile, <laughs> and you get um, and you get six of them, you know, and you get six of them to um, volunteer, then that's that that's fine. But that's still fifty percent. I think that's a bit ambitious. Mm -hmm. However, if you can look at the number of uh, structures in your whole town, and look at the number of um, uh, the number of miles of town roads that you have, that's you know easy enough to just ask the select board to find out and work out what percentage you would have to hit if you built out every road. I promise you, we're not gonna build out every road. It just doesn't make sense. So, what, what I've started to do is calculate a phase deployment radius based on 12 installations or 12 residences per mile. The strategy being start with the town center and assuming a 50% take rate in the town center, what is the radius that I can build out into the rural area out of the town center? And that's the point of discussion that I start to have with people. Okay. But there are a lot of factors here that there's a, there's a provision in uh, the permits that have been issued that it st the state may for its own purposes attach to existing facilities at no cost. 
which would take the pole rental, the strand, we could potentially get build costs below 10,000 a mile. And a lot of miles of road are served, you know, one string of poles serving two sections of road. So it's half the number of, so this, this has to be very precise kind of accounting level uh, facility. And, 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 that's, and that's true. So I'm, I'm talking kind of vision, like future, what this might look like. And all I'm doing is I'm taking EC Fiber's numbers and literally copying them over. Is it going to be 30,000? Is it going to be 40,000? Is it going to be 10? This is something that once we know the technology that we're using, we'll be able to get a better grip on that. I have two questions, but I don't want to derail your presentation here, so should I? If, if, it's, if it's germane to this, I think let's... I can wait till the end, but just okay. how much further we have. Yeah, so I, I only have another another two slides, so let me... Let me can I just say something before you move on to this? I think we have to be careful in thinking one of our main strategy points is to is to go where the customers are, because one of our main goals is to serve people where there aren't customers. So I think we can't be like we can't be like big guys. We can't be like Comcast and, and others who are only going to places where there are people enough people to pay for the service. And I, I, I recognize the economics of this are daunting, and I think there's going to be a real a real feeling that we should go where the greatest number of people don't have service. But I think we have to be careful about how, how we handle that. Right, which which actually I briefly touch on this in the, in the next slide in terms of how we move forward from here and how we decide, you know, who those who those communities are that are going to be served. Um, I, I know, actually, I, I have it here. So, uh, siting. So this is more of what like EC Fiber did. So we've talked about doing a feasibility study, which, as I understand it, is going to be forty to sixty thousand dollars to conduct it in the same way that other communities have. I don't know personally. I don't know. I don't think that that's the best option for us, given the the density and given the um, geographical uh, sparseness of the communities here. Because we might get a you know a statistically good sample size. On the other hand, if we've got you know three respondents from Roxbury and two from Berlin and 15 from Montpelier or whatever, that doesn't necessarily tell us as much as it might if we actually go and knock on doors and say, hey, we are thinking about building this sort of thing here. Is this something that you could get on board with? And get people to, if not commit, at least you know register a letter of intent. Or if they're interested to you know put down a deposit or offer, you know, or um, you know, get on one of these promissory notes for $2,500 or, or something like that. And then um, once we understand these likely, what these likely neighborhoods are, then we can start thinking about, well, what's, you know, what makes the most sense? Is it okay if I talk about demand aggregation? The um, software that fits into that? Sure. Yeah, let, if I can just go through the rest of this and then we can have okay. sort of a larger discussion. Um, so again, my, my vision is to do this canvassing, get a sense of, of where we need to go, whether that's in a slightly more dense location or if there's like a there's like one road in Roxbury. Just keep and, talking about Roxbury. I, well, well and, and, but the, the reason I talk about Roxbury is, is actually if you look, um, if I if I bring up the stats, there is zero there is zero people satisfied by <coughs> cable or like offered cable according to the the yeah. stats that I have zero. in Roxbury. Right. So. I think Roxbury is a great target because your internet service is terrible. I think we should start in Roxbury. <laughs> so, but, but 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 what I'm saying is, if, if there's one, you know, if there's one road in there that's you know, you know, five miles longer, a series of roads in there, and basically everybody's on board, said this is something that we want to do, then it makes sense to start in Roxbury. Or if we find that you know Worcester, if we find that there's a there's a bunch of people in a reasonably good geographically contiguous area where it makes sense to do that, then we can do that. Um, and there are obviously other approaches to doing this but, but as well. Segues right into this. Yeah. So. Um, so, and then once we know where that is, where that's going to be, we can then start crowdfunding. What you know, we can look at what the actual costs are going to be, and go and crowdfund this and get people to. <coughs> Uh, invest in our build out of this. And then after two years of operation, or, or more potentially, we can then look at the bond bank and do something very much like what EC Fiber did, pay back some of those early investors, and then start building from there. 
Um, and then the question of bundling in TV and phone, I, I personally don't think that we ought to be in that business. And then you know, point, point them to third party services like the you know, Roku Box or um, you know, uh, Vonage Direct TV, you know, Direct TV you can get without actually having a, um, with a satellite dish or whatever. You can you know, stream it over your high speed connection there. And I'm gonna hand this off to, to you now Thanks. about the demand aggregation. Yeah, so um, my vision is different from this one. It's not radically different, but it's different. And at some point, I'd like to go through a lot of these different um, suggestions and say, well, I would say it's this way rather than that way. But I don't want to do that now. All I want to do is say that one way to figure out where in a town or which town to go to is to, is to use either commercial demand aggregation software or create your own version of it. And I'll give you an example. There's a company in Sweden called um, Coos Systems, COS Systems. And they make this software where they create a map. We just tell them which neighborhoods, which could be as big as a town, we want to tar separate our whole area into. And then we find one person in each of these areas to be the captain or you can give them any other name. And that captain then rallies the troops to sign up. And they compete one community against another. Who's going to have the highest percentage? And we set a target. We say, we're not going to build to your community until you get 30% or 22% or 80%, whatever we decide. And you can, you can either attach to the sign up a $50 uh, deposit or a $500 investment or zero, just all that of commitment or there's all different ways. We can tailor it any way we want, but if you use the system, you get these communities to compete with each other and that's how you find out where the demand is. And then you don't spend money building somewhere that the take rate's going to be poor. You'll get there eventually, but you want to go, if, if you want the business to survive and keep moving, you have to go you don't have to go to the low hanging fruit, but you have to go to the lower hanging fruit. And this is a way to do that. And there's, there's an American company called Crowd Fiber that does the same thing. I think the Swedish one's a little better, but we could also create our own. I think we have some people here who are good coders and we could create our own as well. But that's a really good way to gauge interest in a, in a neighborhood of a town or a whole community or a collection of communities, depending on what you choose. Thanks for that. So what I'm envisioning our next steps to be, again, personal vision, um, what we're doing right now is setting up the organization, policies, and bylaws and such, um, adding additional members that make sense, um, and then start to identify sources of seed money and these anchor institutions. And that I think that um, three and four, and actually three, four, and five sort of all tie together, and especially with the, with the software that uh, Michael's talking about to do that demand aggregation and to get, to get a sense of where we're going to start and how we're going to start. Um, and then, so maybe we are able to move quickly enough on this. I think, I don't think 2019 is probably going to happen, but 2019, 2020, look at, you know, what does that first small deployment look like? Five miles, 10 miles? Um, and that location of the deployment partially dictates where the, the back office stuff would be. So that's something that, that Michael talked about too, is you can't just run the wires and hope for the best. There's um, you know, support staff that, that are required. Um, there's people to actually watch the computers with their blinking lights in some building somewhere. It has to, you know, that yeah. has to happen. And I think probably initially we would hire a contractor, somebody that's had some experience doing this already. And I have um, a lot of really excited students that would want to do internship for zero cost. And I can and I can offer them class credit to, and I can have a number of these students at any given time to do that. So um, and these are these are things that they're happy to do and in a lot of cases they have experience managing networks and managing data centers because we have a student run uh, data center at the university already. So they can take their experience there and duplicate that elsewhere. Kind of related to that, with EC Fiber, it seemed like a key part of their success was having that. 
kind of off the shelf ISP <laughs> ready to run operations. And I, I guess that's one of the worry. You know, I, I, I don't want to say this. We're we're a board. It's very hard for us to be execution oriented. Um, and so you need that partner that's really just you know the execution partner. And I mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if other people have other thoughts. You know, is that something that's like an item? To 3A or 3B, where it's like, is that what you mean by anchor institution, or is that? And it and it, it could be that too. So if let's say Norwich University, yeah. they wanted to get get on board with this, right. and they could use some of their IT staff to support right. this as well, or, then then yes. Uh, on the other hand, you know there is, there's an ISP in Northfield that could conceivably be I mean, Washington Electric. Interested. There's some other Washington entities Electric. out there that have some of the infrastructure that you would want, i.e., field service and that Absolutely. kind of stuff. That, you know, but it, and it's going to be going and talking to those people and finding out where that is. You know, maybe um, somebody mentioned uh, Goddard, for example. Yeah. Um, they're at, in a pretty geographically nice location. They do have some IT staff there, and they do have buildings which are necessary to obviously to, to host these things. So this is a good segue to my questions. Mm -hmm. you, you hit on one thing, and then you hit on the second thing. Perfect. Um, we have a client that. We worked on their house on the Braintree Hill extension of EC Fiber as they were putting it in. One of their complaints was it took forever to get everything going. And as EC Fiber, I don't know if you know this, as they this is question one, uh, have they figured out sort of their staffing in terms of having enough people to do what they need? Is that one of the, their biggest struggles in trying to staff that? Do you, do you know anything about that? So they they have had a little bit of challenge with staffing because they are not the highest paying organization as a as a municipality they're not they're not super competitive there as far as I know they they are staffed up to where they want to be the problem I think that they were having with the, the delays they were they were seeing was getting poll access so because the people who own the polls are like we just we don't have any incentive to actually follow the rule of the law and actually give them access to that well, that leads into the other question about you know, who actually does this? I, I I live in Roxbury. I am literally the end of the line of 18,000 feet from the last spot for my DSL. Um, <laughs> it got to the point, actually, when we bought our house 13 years ago, we had better DSL service than we do now. Um, it got to the point where banks were timing me out, trying to do, my bookkeepers trying to do work on the bank, and it was taking too long, so they thought I was trying to hack in or something and I'd get timed out. <laughs> yeah. I have been the proverbial squeaky wheel to TDS, who is a service provider there, um, also serves Norwich University. Um, I've, I spoke to our town three years ago, trying to see if anyone wanted to. Our, the, the trouble between Braintree Hill and Roxbury is seven miles, I think, of nowhere. There's literally like three houses um, to get from A to B. No one ever said anything. Um, of the interest of that. But I've often thought about something like this, or where EC Fiber could basically take us over or take over TDS. And I also think about this as, uh, you know, I've had so many conversations with TDS way beyond the typical interaction that a client would have with them. I finally, after probably four years of sending like once a month trouble, tickets into them, got them to rebuild our copper line. It's funny you said no one's building copper lines. TDS is, because uh, it's cheaper than them putting in fiber. I've asked them how much it would be for me to put fiber onto my road and just pay for it, because I was so sick of it, and it's $80,000. Um, but during that rebuild, I got to talk to some people within TDS that aren't your typical customer service people, which they've now farmed out. It used to be Wisconsin. Um, great friendly people now it's who knows where terrible service horrible the people that I know the people that work on lines they can't stand the TDS although they won't say that um, they become a terrible company in terms of how they're serving our community they're not interested in it by any means um, I'm not sure TDS's inclination to want to serve this I, they buy a lot of rural telecom services around the country, that's who they serve, as far as I understand. Yeah. You probably know a lot more about this than I do. But basically the feedback was, we're gonna build these out, 
when we get the federal funding to build it up. And zero interest in doing anything beyond that because they are literally, it's, it's got to be a loss for them. I can't see how they're making any money off of Roxbury and serving it. They probably had to do it. Um, so I've thought about a situation like this where perhaps we take over them and other companies in terms of the management of them so that the TDS technicians no longer have to work for TDS. We just pay TDS rent for their, they have the trucks, they have the equipment, they have the same thing with whatever uh, communities that we serve if it's a different company than TDS to, so that we don't have to become a telecom company or just a management company. It sounds like that's what EC Fiber did with ValleyNet. Is that more or less about what yeah, they did? Yeah, with, the, with the, the one big caveat that, that ValleyNet is a nonprofit. Right. So I don't know how that fits into the overall vision, but certainly i got to imagine that Norwich University is the biggest telecom client in this entire region. Um, so to get them, I mean, we have a fiber trunk that runs right into Roxbury. It is right there. And... Um, it, you know, it's so frustrating. Our school, I'm a school board member, our school has a dedicated fiber line running right into it, but they're the only ones in. Um, and because we worked it that out with TDS, but it's all there, they're just not gonna do it. And I would love to see maybe a way to put all that to good use, so. Is ValleyNet interested in expanding? That's, uh, that's something I, I mentioned, and um, they didn't laugh me out of the room. Um, <laughs> You know, obviously they're they're busy. They would need to need to ramp up, but I I don't think that's impossible. And do they do the actual physical connections to houses? They do. They do the installations. They yeah, they're on the staff. No, well, well, I mean, I was wondering about that, but I mean, I, I the guys who run around. There's three guys I think that run around and serve our community at the Northfield <laughs> TDS office. And I know them all. They've all been up to my house, and they uh, you know. I, I can see it wearing on them every year because it gets worse and worse because they're not giving them the resources that they need. They have, they know exactly what to do to make my service better. TDS won't give them the equipment. Yeah, the one the one warning on all that, but the, the consolidated and the TDS is it's a very woolly world. Um, they're very very they're highly they're highly they're poorly capitalized. They're very indebted. They have very they have a lot of legacy union and other issues and service issues, and they have really. Strange cultures. Um, in the, uh, I would say, just I mean, the company I work for right now, we are actually one of the things we're trying to do is a financial engineering deal where we take over management aspects of their business for them, um, and for just TDS. for those very reasons. Well, for companies like TDS, oh, let's yeah. put it that way. And it's, but it's, that I, it would be something that I would want anyone else to get to. <laughs> <laughs> I guess would they like to way. absolve themselves of the responsibility and just collect a rent check? Though? Well, they like, it's it's like you, you hit it. They, yeah. they tend to take federal grant money and do poorly with it. Yeah. So. I'm sending around the data from the Public Service Department, January 2018, the types of connections that are in that town in the district. And I, I see the Roxburgh. It's, it's and it's zero. zero. I, I, I also put this up on the Google Drive, so there's an electronic copy of that for anybody that wants to wants to see it as well. Which yeah, which so, um, you know, while your select board was initially a little bit um, re reluctant, I think to um, to put this on the ballot, I think you know. I think your, your town is almost certainly the one most in need of it, in need of something like what we're proposing here. Is any final um, commentary or thoughts about the presentation I just gave? Otherwise, we'll move on to rules of procedure. Okay. CVI rules of procedure. This is. Yes, I distributed them. Any questions? Yes. I think they. I think they segue, but. Um, you know, in terms of you presenting a vision and disagreement of the vision. I got another like, disagreement. It seems like that might be something that could be uh, to sent to the governance committee um, to discuss. Okay. Time, so. I can't make formal motions or anything, but just something that might suggest. Let's discuss so, and hash out, build on. So, um, Sending that over to the to the, the, the bylaws committee to chew on that and digest that and, sure. and like have competing visions pr presented there. Does that does that does that make you think that makes that sense? I would suggest it's just something to put on the agenda for a full meeting and basically contrast the different visions and opportunities uh, so that everybody. I don't think a bylaws committee is going to be able to okay. convey that. 
So, um, how, how about this? As, as I'm crafting the agenda for the next meeting, should we make it like a hour and a half or two hour discussion, and we can sort of you can talk about the different um, the different models that you're you're imagining. I can talk about the model that I'm imagining, and you can also present. Um, you, you said you had a couple of disagreements in there too, and we can essentially I'll I'll bring one of the big like white sticky papers, and we can just put it all out there. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Okay, I will. So we'll say um, vision discussion. Yeah, I want you to disagree with mine. Is what, what I'm. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, oh, I know already. that Michael's presentation is on the Google Drive. Was the one that you just gave on the Google Drive? I, I, I put it on there today. Okay. Yes. And the EC Fiber one as well? EC Fiber one is actually, yeah, that one's been up there for, for some time. Um, I also sent it off to, to Orca, so they should also, they'll probably have it on, you guys link to that on your site. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the CBI Rules of Procedure, this is a report back from the Bylaws and Policy Committee. Um, this looks um, this looks great. Um, would you just want to give us a quick overview? Of, quick yeah. Overview? That'd be great. So uh, the bylaws, Bylaw and Policy Committee was charged with uh, developing some rules of procedure uh, for our board meetings. Um, we moved forward with that using uh, the, the Mont League of Cities and Towns model rules of procedure for municipal boards combined with uh, material from the governing statutes for communications union districts, um, some material from the open meeting law and also some material that we uh, uh, that came from Robert's Rules of Order and what we developed on our uh, developed ourselves uh, from some conversation. Um, just running through it, um, the purpose and authority uh, first section borrows largely from the governing statute for communications union district. I believe I've, has everyone got a copy of what I'm talking about? The annotated version. Okay. Do you have any copies? Just the one I've got one actually I, I can look on it like Thanks. Um, you want comments as you go through exactly? Yeah, why don't you go if you would offer me whatever suggestions you have on it as we're going through that would be helpful okay, The one the one uh, comment I had is on the third paragraph we added the chair however without such specific authorization may speak for the governing board on that is, I would say, an adopted policy. I mean, I, I get a little nervous when the board chair is allowed to do anything they want. Okay. But I, I, that's just for discretion. I don't. Mm -hmm. the matters of adopted policy. Is that is everybody amenable to that? Boy, I see a lot of red flags there. I do. That means you have to have everything voted on before the board chair can ever speak about it. I don't think. But, uh, yeah, I just said um, I'm not sure it's a great idea to have the board chair only speak to adopted policy. It means the board chair can't speak unless the board has vetted and voted on uh, an item. And what does this mean then? <laughs> well, what it means generally is that you have faith in the board chair for speaking for the entire organization and reflecting what the organization has developed, worked on, and stands for. You don't want to have every single board member having that authority. Instead, you want to have, to have the official word of what the organization is doing sort of filtered through the chair, who hopefully has the balance that is reflective of where all board members think the organization should be moving. Adopted policy really put you into... Well, what is spending. policy then? Well, that's something we talked about in our meeting because at some point we probably want to talk about things like policies versus resolutions versus positions. Um, I mean, policy typically means in a municipal body like a school board, something that a subcommittee has worked on for a number of weeks or months to develop it's gone through an approval process. It goes to a board. It gets formal approval there. It can be a. You know, sometimes you have to have double, double approvals before the policy can be put in place. So policy is usually thought of as a very formal procedure that has a lot of rules connected to it. So that's why I'm. 
that's why I'd be worried about getting into something called adopted policy, because it then implies a whole system mm -hmm. for developing and vetting the policy. I think you have to have somebody who can speak for the organization when, when a reporter or when a legislator calls up and wants somebody to testify. You have to have somebody who I think it would normally be the chair uh, of the board who it can be trusted to give an overview of what the organization stands for and is working on. Well, that's I a little bit the, different than policy, though. Yeah, I think the caution there is that, and, and that we've spoken about this, that in effect we've gotten off, uh, for better or worse, with a, a vision being put forth that hasn't been voted on or adopted. Uh, the press has run with that, including speeds and timelines and dollar figures. You know, I can see it now, including we're not going to have television. There's all kinds of pitfalls in not having an agreed upon vision or purpose and having one person be able to convey that because it can get distorted very quickly. And I, before the first meeting, I had spoken to Jeremy and, and basically said, a lot of those things are yet to be decided. I appreciate your energy, but back off and let this committee grow its own, you know, this governing board. And we're at that point where the rubber meets the road in that we're having to decide which of these things are already adopted by all of us as a, a new entity and which of these are parts of the kind of embryonic vision. So just to, so that I can, <clears throat> we can keep moving this along, um, what, how do the, the rest of you feel who haven't maybe spoken about this? Is this a concern? Is this, does this language work here? Should it be changed to adopted policy? Should we strike the whole thing? Just uh, does anybody care, I guess, is maybe the more... I, th I think we should stay away from the word adopted. Because I, I think when you said the word policy, at least in my mind, and you know, working on school boards and all, has a very broad definition under this this process and that you know that this would give the chair, whoever the chair is, the opportunity to speak uh, on behalf of what the board's been discussing, on behalf of what the board's doing, including to be able to give a sense of the board. You know, and sometimes that's very important too in public communications to be able to to say where you sense the board is going with a particular subject. And I, I, I thoroughly agree. You know, you elect a chair, you have to put some faith and trust in the chair to do the right thing with their job. Yeah, so. and the chair can also be removed by two-thirds vote. So if the chair exceeds the chair, there is recourse to the board to deal with it. That's true. It's a nice switch. I, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything we said. I mean, policy is a little bit of a kind of a not really precise word in this context um, because of policy you know. But I think that what Stephen has raised around the danger of uh, our vision, a vision outstripping our vision um, is real. I don't think it should be codified in the bylaws, but I think it's, I think it's worth just yeah. noting and just seeing where we're at at this moment, we just, I think, have to be maybe not speaking as little as possible. We're uh, recommending our chair speak as little as possible. Or now that we are a board consulting, you know, there's more opportunity to have this uh, kind of proceed in a way that we feel like we're all on the same page. Yeah, I would trust that you've heard the and caution. Yeah. Of course, you know? of course. <laughs> well, we're still saying it. Or comedia is about to hear it too. <laughs> I just wonder if there might be some sense in six months or 12 months from now asking the bylaws and policy committee to uh, a, a committee which hopefully is paying attention um, to reflect back on this and, and, and ask, ask them, ask us, is it working? Does it work? And, and what are the weak parts? Where, where are the conflicts that can't be resolved? I, I think I personally think that makes a lot of sense. Anybody else who has not spoken want to weigh in on this? Can, should I take your silence as we leave the um, leave the language as presented? Okay, I, I will take your silence as meaning that then, so we can continue along. Sure. In the next section, application, the, the primary point of interest is uh, amending the rules 
uh, it presently provides that except as otherwise provided by law, these rules may be amended by two-thirds vote of the governing board. The notion being that we want to have some appropriate uh, voting level here. If it's too easy to amend the rules, we'll amend the rules on the fly and they don't mean anything. If it's too hard to amend the rules, they'll never get changed. So I, two-thirds was the number that typically is, uh, if you want to suspend the rules under Robert's Rules of Order, it requires a two-thirds vote. So that was the suggested uh, number in there. Okay. Any objections to that? Okay. Um, organization, it reflects that uh, the, the board is obligated to elect a chair vice and a vice chair. Um, the chair uh, shall preserve order at the meeting. Uh, that language is taken generally right from the governing statute for communications union districts. Um, moving along here, um, it's essentially the role of the vice chair is taken directly from statute as well. Um, the notion of disability resignation or removal of one of those officers uh, forthwith shall uh, elect select, uh, successors also coming directly from statute. The rule for a quorum uh, comes directly from our governing statute as well. Uh, the next, we get into dis Part E, discussions, motions, and voting. Um, the first section Can of I that, take a pause on the quorum? Sure. Because of this problem with subcommittees that we run into. Mm -hmm. uh, committees of only three. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think all, all the committees have only three, mm -hmm. which means any two of them getting together is a quorum, which yes. needs to be warned in minutes, and that's a problem. Um, it's a hassle. It is a hassle, but we haven't been able to have a meeting of one of the committees yet due to that. And so I think we need to beef up the committees and deal with the issue of quorums because even an executive committee of three, you know, I, I, I see the need to get things done, but the executive committee needs to be more than three, as does any committee that's going to really be able to meet effectively. I'd like to go on the record as saying that I don't view the warning and the taking the minutes to be a half second. So <laughs> I, I just really want to go on the record. I I, I'd like to go on the record and say that, that for a meeting of three people, um, the requirement of producing the agenda, making sure that it's been posted, and I trust that it has in every community that a member of this organization um, is quite a burden. Um, I think that generally for the level of work that is that is done on is being done on that committee. Um, it was it's it's quite a bit. Um, I had to take time from my professional obligations to make sure all of that was done. Um, I'm just a volunteer, I'm not paid staff, and it's quite a bit of work and if I characterize it as a hassle, it's okay. Okay. Yep. Can we uh, use the internet and some automation to alleviate that burden a little. Can't we have a regular mailing list that goes to one repository and automatically goes to the town clerks in each of the towns and it's posted so you when we get that set up. Yeah. I think also just flag for a future legislative agenda that uh, especially with these intermunicipal governing bodies, the there's no way to enforce or make sure that uh, something is printed and posted in a town hall. I think it should, we should pursue a modification of law for an intermunicipal district like this to have it suffice to have it on one or two electronic uh, locations. I absolutely agree. And so this is, and this is something not specifically about that, but about some other things that because we are a municipality, we have the opportunity to change our charter, essentially to modify state law according to how we are operating. So we could conceivably change our um, our reporting requirements, our warning requirements, right? We could. We could just have the um, provisions of law addressing communications union district have specific warning requirements that apply only to those, only to such districts, without having to amend the, the entire open meeting law just to accommodate us. So they would still have to be approved by the legislature. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Right. Yes. But so so we could do that by a charter, or we could do that by asking oh, asking. Could we do it by a charter. We're a municipality. We can we can write a charter. Effectively, the the statute is our charter. 
I agree with you. Yes, could we write a charter? Let's save that for okay. another day. <laughs> so, so we, so we could ask somebody to, in, some legislator to introduce a, a bill to change the CUD law. Yes. Okay. Something Jim so, Barlow said was a hazard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the first section, uh, discussion, motion, and voting. The first, the first item there. Informal discussion of an agenda item may be permitted while no motion is pending. Um, all governing board members, which is previously defined to include both delegates and alternates, may uh, present may participate in informal discussion of an agenda item. Um, so the notion being, be, the notion behind that being is, is that we have tremendous amount of knowledge, um, resources, um, great things available to us through our alternates. And we don't want to um, stifle that unnecessarily through our rules of procedure. So the notion being that the introductory discussion on an agenda item, that informal discussion, is open to everyone who is here in the room. Um, a motion shall only be made by a delegate or an alternate serving in the absence of, the, of a delegate. And, and that, that wording, a delegate or an alternate serving in the absence of a delegate, is drawn directly from the statute as inelegant as it may be. It is, in fact, what the law provides. So, so it's only, in, in, excuse me, that language is what the law provides. This is, um, a motion can only be made by a delegate or an alternate serving in the absence of a delegate. So an alternate who is participating, or, or who is present but not participating, cannot make a motion. Okay? All motions shall require a second. We don't have to have a second, but I think in a group this size it would be a good idea to have one. The chair may make motions. In some boards, the chair is not allowed to make motions, but we would allow the chair to make motions here, and may vote on all questions before the board. Only delegates and alternates serving in the absence of a, alternate serving in the absence of a delegate may speak on a motion. So once a motion is made, just to be clear about this, the, once the motion is made, um, only those who are delegates or alternate serving in the absence of a delegate can speak to the motion. So that would effectively bring the discussion from room-wide down to table-wide, okay? And that's the proposal. And I have... Steve has got thoughts. I've got thoughts. <laughs> I, I did attend a committee meeting where this was discussed. Uh, I think that, especially in circumstances where a motion might be tabled and picked up again later, uh, this similar situation will also involve executive sessions, which we haven't touched on. I believe that it's important to allow both primaries and alternates to participate in discussions because of the level of expertise we have here and because of the uh, informed, in, in, in this, this situation here, my primary, if it, anyone would need to make a single motion to, to muzzle me, which I, I would, and then I have no recourse to tap my alternate on the shoulder because he's coming in through a cell phone, right? I mean, my primary. So basically I would be shut out of the discussion on a motion as important as the one we're discussing right now. So. So you disagree? I'm, what is proposed? Yes, I'm disagreeing that once a motion is made, that alternates can't participate. Once a motion is made, only delegates or an alternate serving in the absence of a delegate can participate in the discussion. Oh, meaning if. I get you. If you have a vote, you're the only one. But speak. if your alternate is sitting next to you, they can't speak, right? as opposed to in place of you. You're disagreeing with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any formal uh, rules around absence? Like, I mean, so I mean, we talked about quorums pretty in the last meeting. Like, if three people show up and the alternate is also there, does that suddenly make a quorum? I'm sorry, is there any rules around absence? So right. what, what qualifies as being absent? 
it's, it's especially when you get to like if there's a meeting or potentially a meeting, but this person by the by the delegate not being there, but the alternate being there, that suddenly makes a quorum. Yes, that should have been announced. In the yes, it, potentially yes. Um, well, I think first of all, um, what we were talking about earlier was the quorum requirement for a committee meeting, which is a gathering of the majority of the members of the committee. Um, and yes, if you were to only, let's say we had a five member committee, um, we anticipated that only, we, we had anticipated that only two members, no, that wouldn't, I'm sorry, Let me think about this. Three. Three members were gonna be there, but that would have been a quorum anyway, so we would have worn that. We anticipated that only two, but we also have, I'm sorry, this I'm, I'm verbalizing as I'm thinking, it doesn't never goes well for me when I do that. <laughs> we also have committee members who are alternates. Yes, and even non-board members entirely. And non-board members entirely. They're officially appointed to, to that the, committee. To the committee. So there, there are no such things as alternates when it comes to committees. There are no alternates when so it comes to alter, committees. Alternates <laughs> are, for, are for this board. And so, for example, Mark is sitting in for John tonight, and so if we had only had seven other people and then Mark showed up, he would then become the eighth, we'd get to the quorum eight out of 15, and we'd be good to go then. But when we're talking about a committee meeting, we don't have to worry about that. There's no there are no alternates, alternates to committees. Thank you. But, but, but we do need to make the committees bigger. But we do need to make the committees bigger. Okay. So, the, going back to the original question, um, should, we, should we limit the ability of alternates to participate in discussion once a motion has been made? I would suggest that on a board this size, the fewer people that can speak, the better. Otherwise, you're never going to get through anything. I mean, it's just too many people talking. What do we have here? 18 people? If everyone wants to say something plus an alternate, we'll be here all night trying to do anything. And your town selected you as a representative, and your alternate can pass you notes. Or it's just a huge uh, board to manage. In terms right, of exactly. Anything. I'm on the uh, the policy committee, and the intent here was to really draw a compromise to be able to um, part of the discussion inclusionary um, and have that as broad as we possibly could. But when it came to the point that a you know a motion being made, you're moving to decision time, that it becomes it is an unmanageable uh, size group. If we don't have some structure for doing that, then literally every every alternate is then acting as a board member. And <clears throat> I think that changes the whole dynamic and also the intent of the law to so say, there's a delegate and there's an alternate. So we wanted to be inclusionary in one respect as far as having as much discussion as we could, but we also then wanted to draw a balance and be able to draw some focus so that things don't go on all, all night. And you know, get to a decision point. So. Um, I, I, and again, I participated in the draft of the language. I highly recommend that you adopt this as written. So again, in the interest of moving forward with this, if I could get a show of hands for how many people would uh, like to keep the language the way it was presented? Can I just see a show of hands for who would like to keep the language? Okay. Okay. So I think that's um, that satisfies me enough that we should move forward on this. Um, there shall be no limit to the number of times a delegate or an alternate serving in the absence of a delegate may speak to a motion. So we are going to um, not, essentially not, again, as it follows there, not limit debate. So motions to close or limit debate will not be entertained. What's the motivation there? Because again, in a, in having served in some, several boards where we just need to get to it, I'm, I'm a fan of this is like the filibuster in the board. Yeah. So um, I, I'm a fan of limiting debate, and I'm a fan of calling the question, calling the question um, sometimes when it's not used, um, you know, as a blunt instrument. Uh, again, having having been involved with the, the drafting of this, I think our our sense was there. There's 
you know, a couple of different things here. There's, you know, this piece of language uh, basically saying that, yes, you can speak uh, to an issue multiple times, but that it also is up to uh, the chair mm -hmm. to make some decision about running the meeting that says, Phil, you've said the same thing three times, I'm not calling on you again. Now, if I've said three different things, because, you know, as we have discussions, we bird walk into different areas, then you might make a choice, say, oh, okay, yeah, I can speak to that. So I think it's the combination of the role of the chair and the language written here that has, you know, develops the, the medium, meeting decorum. But this runs contrary to what was just a uh, straw poll earlier. If you're basically trying to limit debate here by saying we don't, we want to limit our debate by keeping the alternates from participating, and then here we want unlimited debate once we've narrowed it down to the primaries. Well, I think it leads yeah, to the board good. chair. Yeah. 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 If people are unhappy with the way the board chair is running the meeting, yeah, the chair. Yeah. that's sort of the function of that. Is board the chair is is here to aggregate all of the knowledge in the discussion and when it gets offline it's the board chair's job to put it back online and or deal with the consequences if people are unhappy with that again. So can someone take this thing? I'm, I'm generally opposed to calling the question. Um, I hate meetings that drag on but I hate cutting people off too. Um, I think there's enormous power we have a benign despot chairman, and he has the power to steer that conversation a lot, in several ways and blunt ways, and therefore I don't think it should be codified that you only get to speak twice on a topic or that there's a two-thirds vote to call a question. I think that the chair can use his discretion, and if we're not happy with that, we can tell him. Then why can't the chair use his discretion to call on alternates, who obviously have you know, concern with the topic at hand. I would, if I may. Hold on. Go ahead. I'd say that the alternates are not, unless they're serving the place of the delegates, are not voting on the motion. The debate around the motion is germane to voting ultimately on the motion. I think that just like we entertain public comment where we have the public maybe be able to speak during informal agenda items or when we're debating the motion, it just I mean, that's the line, right? It's, it's not an arbitrary line. It really is about who is going to be voting. So could we, could we do another straw poll? Um, how many folks want to keep the language, the motions to close or limit debate will not be entertained? How many folks want to keep that language there? OK, how many folks do not want to keep that language there? OK. So I mean, I, I, I think the, I think the Folks in favor of keeping it are, are probably going to win this one. Um, maybe maybe we come come back to this. I think if it doesn't work, we're going to be can back I, to it. Can I just say real quick here, because I think as we go along, there's not a whole lot of powers running the meeting that the, a board has, you know, as, as a board, not, not separating us out from chairman, vice chair, et cetera. And one of them, of course, is to... Uh, call the question to seize debate and to move on with things. And it takes majority to do that. So, I mean, it's not going to be a successful motion to call the question unless a majority It's actually like, two-thirds, though. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll work with that number. I'll work with that number. I'm not sure. I, okay. That's true. I won't argue the point. Um, that, that even makes my point, I think, a bit more. The fact that it would still take two-thirds that in order to close off the bait and go on to the boat. And this is one, and, and I, I'll tell you, I'm going that, you know, that I was there at the discussion. I did have a bite at the apple. I will vote for this to go through as it is. The people don't want to change it. However, I do think that the board gives up a very important power that it has by giving up the ability to call the question. And, you know, it's just not a lot of control over the meeting that the board itself exercises. <laughs> well, well, well played, Dan. Well played. Um, okay, so let's let's move on from here if we can. Okay. Um, the next sentence just addresses the notion that um, 
Uh, if someone has spoken to a topic, they can't be recognized again until others have had the first opportunity uh, to comment or until others have been given the opportunity to comment as many times as any other speaker has commented. So we try and even out the debate as it goes along. Um, any delegate or alternate serving in the absence of a delegate may request a roll call vote. The request must be sustained by at least one member. Um, Alan, I think that was, maybe you could give the thinking behind request must be sustained by at least one member. Yeah, I, that's a standard rule in the legislature, those of you who have been there. And I think the thinking is sometimes you can have one person who really has a bug about something and they're going to gum up the works for the next 45 minutes by having a roll call vote and at least, you know, make the person get a second person agreeing this is important enough to have a roll call. That seems to make sense to me. Okay. Um, the next provision addressing roll call votes is, comes directly from the open meeting law. Uh, requiring a roll call vote is required for votes that are not unanimous when we've got someone participating electronically. Um, each member's delegation shall be entitled to cast one vote. That comes directly from our governing statute. Only delegates and those alternates serving in the absence of a delegate shall vote. Just to clarify that, uh, who is authorized to vote. Any action adopted by a majority of votes cast at a meeting of the governing board at which a quorum is present shall be the action of the board except as provided in the governing statute. Um, the provisions uh, requiring for, for agendas are taken largely uh, right from the open meeting law. Um, I mean, if there's anything that, in particular that needs to be explained there, we can go over it, but otherwise I think we could just move right through it. Um, I think that it's... Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, meetings... Um, Section G as well, largely directly right from the open meeting law, sort of a layman's interpretation of what the law provides. Um, public participation. Members of the public should be afforded reasonable opportunity to express opinions about matters considered by the governing board as long as order is maintained according to these rules. That's uh, again a, a provision of the open meeting law. Um, the next could be dealt with in different ways. At the beginning of each meeting, there should be 10 minutes afforded for open public comment. By majority vote, the governing board may increase the time for open public comment and its place on the agenda. So some boards will have open comment period at the beginning of their, of their meeting. Some will have a public comment opportunity for each agenda item. Some are real nasty and make the public wait until the end of the meeting, and they've got to sit there the whole night before they get an opportunity to speak. Um, this seemed like a reasonable starting point if there was going to be any discussion. So at the beginning of the meeting, 10 minutes afforded for open public comment. So, Chip? Yes? Can just uh, increase in the time, was that by vote at that meeting or prior in the agenda or? At that meeting. Okay, so if something's really germane and we all think it's worth hearing more about, we just say, let's extend our 10 minutes. Exactly right. Okay. okay. Could I raise a, an issue with that? Uh, sometimes there's an issue on the agenda, and it's important to hear what is going on before <coughs> you provide your public comment, uh, to be informed your public comment. Mm -hmm. And maybe there should be a provision to, you know, uh, at the discussion of the chair, reopen a public comment period later in the meeting. So, so this is this is handled fairly well and fits within this. So, at, during any agenda item, I and mean, if you um, when I, when we had the public comment period tonight, one of the things I said is, anybody have any comments about something that's not on the agenda? Right. So that when we get to an agenda item, if there's a member of the public or an alternate or somebody that wants to speak to that in that sort of unstructured initial time before there's a formal motion. That's the time for the public comment and for people to to weigh in, and that's and that's H one is I think. Excuse me a second. I, I, I things are breaking up for me, so I'm going to have to just say I really appreciate the work you've done so far, and if I I, I know I'm pre predetermined before there is a vote, but if I can uh, express my uh, support for the uh, way you have framed this so far, I really uh, would like to include that in my position, but. It's very hard for me to not understand because of the 
just now to come to line exactly more of what's being said. And so I'm going to have to sign off now. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Thanks. Uh, 8.25, Dan Jones left the meeting, and welcome to court. No, you can't shut me up. But Mr. Whitaker, the difference is now you get to vote. Yes. <laughs> but uh, Jim, with, with respect to your committee work, is it appropriate to make any suggestions here to further changes? I'm, I'm looking at meetings G, emergency meetings and special meetings. Yeah. And it occurred to me that uh, inserting the word something to the effect of with notice to prior requesting individuals and press, because some there is provision under statute that press and... Any person who has requested notice of such meetings? It's yes. A, it's in there. It's in there. H1. But that's G1. special. An emergency <coughs> doesn't require any prior notice. <coughs> You give as much notice as you can give under the circumstances. And you don't have to give notice to the press on emergencies. No. <laughs> okay. Hey, Jeremy. Excuse me. I, I apparently have a stuck at fault here on the public meeting or the public comment period. Um, it would seem to me that having one single public comment period for a fixed time at the start of the meeting forces you to batch process stuff before you've had a chance to discuss the actual item. Uh, in previous board meetings in corporate America, the technique generally has been limited public comment on the topic in play at the time, and that seems to work much more effectively than having a free-for-all at the beginning of the meeting. So I got a stuck at fault by having everything batch processed and everybody's got to remember it from the front of the meeting. So, um, so, so no, I, I, I thought I addressed this before, but the public participation 10 minutes at the beginning is for any items that are not on the agenda. It's, ex it's okay. And then, exclusively non-agenda items. And then once as we get that's clear, I'm, I'm comfortable. And then once we get to agenda items, then it's the then members of the audience can go and weigh in at that, that point. That should be a fixed time increment. It can't be a free-for-all. <coughs> yeah. But well, it's ten minutes right now. So so it's it's a it's a ten up, up to a ten minute free for all at the very beginning. That's fine. But but the weighing in on each agenda item is going to be people called on by the chair. So it's going to be the chair's responsibility to make sure that things don't go off the rails. That, that would make it easy for easier for a man of my uh, aging and infirmed intelligence to deal with. <laughs> so we ought to have a provision that authorizes the chair to do that in the rules. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and so a, uh, the chair should be given the authority or, uh, to discretion to uh, um, allow public comment on an agenda item as I'll come up with a little And that could be actually a safety valve to the alternates not getting to participate in a discussion <laughs> yeah. on, a, on a motion. Yeah, it, it, I think that that's a critical piece and it should be at the chair's discretion. <coughs> also, part of that public comment period, particularly in a municipal situation as opposed to a corporate situation, is you never know who you're going to get in terms of trying to derail things at the beginning. And it's their responsibility, as every board member's responsibility, to read the agenda, read the appropriate materials, and comment on the board the board's work for that at the beginning because they are not a member of the board. They're more than welcome and we welcome their comments, but it's their job to do their homework, come in and say, I think here's my feeling on this and I'd like to have the opportunity to speak when you talk about it if possible and not just get random rants and particularly with this many communities involved, that's, there's a high likelihood of that. And, 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 I, and I, th I think you have a good point. So that's sort of like belt and suspenders approach where during public comment they want to say, and I want to be sure that I'm heard about item X. I think that makes sense. Can I just suggest that it's an option be at the chair's discretion? I mean, simply because the way we're framing this right now and that they, if you're going to say that the Formal public participation is for items not on the agenda. You still have to give the public, uh, and, you know, taking it out of the law. There, they have to be afforded the reasonable opportunity to express opinions and about matters considered. You know, so if you're going to say that this 10 minutes is for items not on the agenda, then 
the implication is that you can't talk about the things on the agenda. So mm -hmm. that it wouldn't, it, it, if we're going to do it, which I think, by the way, I think the way that it's being outlined with, uh, you know, doing the agenda by agenda item, but I, it shouldn't, I don't see how it could be at the chair's discretion. It would be Actually, public participation. Yeah. Well, it's public participation subject to reasonable rules right. by the chair. So it actually... But not at... Right. I, I th yeah, I think that there's some discretion on the part of the chair to, to, to uh, qualify that discussion, but probably right. not to prohibit it altogether. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I understand we have some disagreements on the details of that, but having yeah, said that, we're in agreement on that part of it for sure. Okay. So, so Mr. I'm, I'm, un, I'm hearing a, a, an, an amendment here to these about public participation, an opportunity at, at the outset to comment on matters not on the agenda, and then the ability to comment on items yeah. on the agenda as those items are by the board. That okay. sound, sounds about right, and I, and I, I guess I, I thought that H1 covered that, but it, it, I guess it couldn't hurt to be more explicit. Okay. So, I have a question. I, I haven't been on a lot of boards. Um, is it common for the public to weigh in on any matter that's coming up for vote? Mm -hmm. Yes. It is? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the dictator I, would say no. <laughs> I would move we amend H to add on the following, the chair shall afford the public opportunity to comment on agenda items. And I'm just yeah. throwing that just, just as a starting point, because I know that's an artful to put, but I think that's, that's where I was trying to get to. Reasonable opportunity? Well, uh, careful. I, I mean, you could say, I mean, it's straight out of the law to say okay. afford a reasonable opportunity to express opinion. So so could we, maybe so, H1, if we change that to members of the participant public shall be afforded reasonable opportunity to express opinions about matters considered by the governing board in the order of, or as those agenda items are discussed. Sure, you can replace my motion. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been seconded yet, so we can do it. So, so there's, th th there's actually no motion to amend right now, so... And, and your motion wasn't seconded. Right. Well, that's why I was saying it could change it and it wouldn't matter. So, um, so, so if we can maybe continue sort of informally wordsmithing this a bit, I, I, I personally don't think we're probably going to be ready to approve this tonight, but I think if we can give, um, you know, give some feedback to Jim and you can just um, put in some of those changes, we can come back and actually do a do a vote for this first thing with, uh, with less discussion next time? Mm -hmm. That way I don't get to vote against it. <laughs> so, yeah, 1210 12, still passes when it's, you know, versus 13, 1300. So, so um, last section, order and decorum. Um, order and decorum should be observed by all persons present at the meeting. Um, the notion here is that, that we want to keep some semblance of order and have um, uh, some reasonable provisions for managing the meeting. Um, the language that's used here is members of the governing board and, its mem and members of the public are prohibited from making personally offensive, non-germane, or threatening remarks. Non-germane are, are those that are not relative, relevant to the discussion. So that, that seems uh, reasonable. Threatening is... is um, First Amendment Supreme Court uh, law uh, about fighting words. So um, would be, and then personally offensive. Uh, reasonable per, reasonable people could could disagree about that particular term, but I think that the notion here is that that we shouldn't have to be subjected to to um, we shouldn't subject each other, uh, nor should we be subjected to you know offensive. Terms and we should keep it civil in our discussion. Does that mean ad hominem, or does that mean you don't, or you you're not allowed to swear? Which kind of offensive are we talking about? In the words Personally. of Rodney King, can't we all get along? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why not? Why not put both in? I mean, the, the issue of offensive doesn't necessarily include ad hominem, and uh, I personally think that the specific citation for. Uh, not permitting ad hominem attacks in addition to offensive words is in order. So from so prohibited from making offensive or ad hominem offensive, comma, ad hominem, sure comma, non-germane, comma, or threatening remarks. 
Okay. So if I want to say damn, I have to give a trigger warning? So it really really boils down to order being maintained and us being civil. So if you think what something you're going to say isn't civil, don't say it. I mean, the, the difficulty, though, is that it's also a, a, a perspective limitation on speech, and we are the government. Okay. And, and um, folks have a First Amendment right to criticize us, and in some cases to use naughty words, and they do that. Um, it's finding the appropriate balance to that that is really the, the hard question. Mm -hmm. um, Samantha B went over the line. S Samantha B called Iva Ivana. I, I, C I, I, word. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I, I would be actually more comfortable taking out personally offensive altogether, leaving it as non-germane and threatening, and just trusting each okay. other to to uh, be on our best behavior. Consensus. I agree. I, I would like to add too, though. That, you know, it's, if we put together a set of board expectations that we're going to apply against each other, because the 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 bit about the non-germane, personally offensive, etc., threatening remarks, that's going to have more to do with the public. I mean, that that's a, a we're, we're allowed to make rules stifling each other's speech, right? I mean, that, that's how committees and boards work. The, the rules don't allow you to go off and say anything you want for as long as you want to say it. Um, so I, 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 you know, we, we had this discussion. This is another one I would vote with that phrase in there. I did not, perso I did not personally like it. I found it personally offensive. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, listen, I, I, I will vote for it because, you know, I, I, you know, I think this is one of those things that will either work itself out or just be immaterial over time. And I think most of the times it ends up being immaterial. As as written it says it's prohibited, but there's no sanction. it's not spelled out in terms of the sanction for that prohibition. Yeah, so okay. it can it can be there so that it guides people to not do those things, but ultimately it would I guess be the board to decide if someone is out of line whether or not they can be part of the board anymore. But it also guides the chair. Yeah, it's the one that is not the remedy, if, if, if the remedy that is available if someone were to be out of line and use personally offensive speech is to uh, remind the individual of our rules of procedure, declare a recess or table the issue, or adjourn in the meeting to a date and time certain. So, you know, if you want to be, if you want to be using like that stuff like that, we'll just all go home um, and come back another day. It's not an, it's not a sanction against the individual, not penalizing them, we're just going to take a break. And, and not to mention that we all serve at the, at the pleasure of our respective select boards and city councils, and we can just say, hey, this guy's it's, not, it's not working out, <laughs> and ask you to be replaced, or ask me to be replaced, for that matter. Yeah. So if a lot of this is more germane to the public and their presence, does that mean we call off the meeting because someone who shows up and is just... It's, it's yeah. certainly happened before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've seen meetings being taken over by people who came there to take over a meeting from the good perspective of the public. I mean, I, I think in the end, these are really aspirational. Of course. What we're stating is these are our values, these things are important to us, we don't insult each other, we don't yell at each other. But people may go ahead and do it anyhow, but I think that short of a lawsuit being filed and having to go through that, it's really just an aspiration. This is how we'd like you to act. Okay, so as I'm as I'm hearing it, we have the the option to keep the language as is or to strike the personally offensive part. Um, again, we'll just do a quick temperature check, straw poll. How many folks want to leave leave the language as it is, as it's presented? Okay. Okay. How many folks want to strike the bit about personally offensive? Okay, so it's pretty dead even. Is there um, is there some compromise? Couldn't you argue that 
being personally offensive is non-germane. Yes, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I, you could be sure to take over by saying personally offensive is not germane. Yeah. Therefore, obviating the need for the personally offensive to be in there because that's a judgment call. What, something that offends one person is not going to offend somebody else. Yeah. The original word was impertinent. Um, which is yeah. not a good word in a rude way. And I was hearing vindictive or something. Yeah, that's what that so, <laughs> that's we didn't like that one either. So, so, uh, so do we want to, so personally offensive to impertinent, non-germane, or threatening? Or is impertinent a, like a loaded legal word? I don't think it's not germane. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, what does it mean? It's like. Okay, so non-germane or threatening. Just leave it. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. st strike the personally offensive? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 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 Wonderful. And um, Jim went over to A, B, and C already. And then we've got some signatures that we will not be signing. Correct. Right. Um, parting thoughts before we move to the next thing in our remaining two minutes. Why do people put this face intentionally left one in two minutes of points? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Non germane. Okay. So, um, so at, at your at your leisure, if you want to shoot us back a, a updated copy of that, and we'll um, bring printed copies next time and have everybody sign. We'll be ready to go. We'll do it. Okay. Okie dokie. Policy on conflict of interest. Conflicts of interest policy. All right. Shall we? Um, adopt the same, maybe slightly higher tempo version of what we have just done. I think this one is a little bit shorter. It's a little bit more, um, I think, better understood. Okay. If you could just give me a moment while I pull up my electronic version of it, I would it. Sure. You want to use this one? No, I just want to use it electronically so I can see the color better. Um, While he's doing that, does anybody want to take any initial, um, put an initial commentary out for this? It is reasonably short. I can, I mean, I can speak a little bit. I'm, I was on the committee. A lot of this comes from either statute or from model policies, like the League of Cities and Towns. And I think one of the difficult things for a lot of people in Vermont, a lot of people who serve the public, is understanding what a conflict of interest is. Mm -hmm. um, as much as anything, and then what do you do about it when one is identified? And generally, the the the, the way that a lot of public bodies, including the legislature, uh, handle conflict of interest is really self-identification as much as anything. The person who thinks he has a conflict of interest is expected to tell that to the group, and. The way this is written and the way most models are written, um, we don't have the power to censure or to uh, bounce somebody out if we disagree that they have a conflict of interest, because we don't have the authority. We've all been sent here by our towns. This board doesn't have the, has the authority. I think the way Jim's explained it to me, and I think he's right, we don't have the authority to overturn a decision made by a member town. We can't go to the town and say, this isn't working out for a person to ask, but we can't <coughs> censure the person and then ask them to leave. So that's, I think, the root of the self-identification of a conflict and self-determination, whether the conflict really does pose something that the person should, should, should be a trigger for recusing him or herself from, <coughs> from an issue. So if this sounds a little bit weak and mealy mouth, that's the history behind why it sounds that way. It's pretty hard to figure out a way to to judge when a conflict is truly a conflict and to take a sanction that's appropriate. And we're not the first people to discover the difficulty of doing this. It's, it's hard. I have a general question about the whole topic. Um, if uh, a board member believes he or she has a conflict of interest and chooses to volunteer to recuse him or herself, does that mean they also are unable to speak to any of the issues? Or are they recusing themselves from the vote? 
so the, the way the way we've done this in the past in the town of Berlin is that person becomes a member of the public. They res yeah. temporarily resign from the board and they sit in the audience. So they can talk when it would be appropriate for members of the public to talk as well. Okay. Um, but, but I think in that case, if you know, if, if I were stepping down um, because I had a conflict, uh, my alternate could presumably come up and provided that he didn't also have a, have a conflict, mm -hmm. could then represent Berlin. Mm -hmm. Board yeah, we, we do the same thing in Omar. We've, uh, I've had this happen. I've had a conflict, and in our board, we sp I spoke and then left. That's not just in the up. audience, out, like, and was not part of the vote, not part of the rest of the discussion. I gave my said my piece, and left, and then it was up to the board to decide on that, so that there wasn't the awkwardness of. Right. That person glaring down, mm -hmm. there. Yeah. down yeah. there, and you know, for everyone to discuss it within that context. But it was able to, and I think it's up to the board and how they want to handle that. Whether that person, I mean, I self acknowledged the conflict and then spoke to my feelings on the subject matter, and then left. <coughs> so they were able to do with it the way they wanted to. I don't think you can mandate that because of open meeting law, so. Mm -hmm. The way, we, the way we specifically addressed it is that a governing board member who has recused him herself or herself from a matter under consideration shall not participate in board discussion, shall not participate in any board discussion, vote, or other official action on that matter. So no discussion, no vote, you are, you are, off, in, in quite, you are off, off the table. It goes on to say that upon recusal of a governing board member who is a member municipality's designated representative, the members, the municipality's alternate shall serve in the absence of the designated representative. So then your alternate steps up to the table to have a conflict of interest and accuse yourself. You, you just reminded me of something I forgot that the other committee, the prior document still needs to address how if executive sessions are handled, how alternates are handled in executive sessions. Because actions, if. Yeah. Let, me, let me just go back to that. Um, only, only the members, only the serving members of the board can vote to go into executive session. Um, they can invite into executive session any persons that they want to invite in. So they potentially could invite in alternates to participate in the discussion. So I don't think that we need to address okay. it in our rules of procedure. Yeah, and that's it's pretty clear in the statute. I mean, so so well, it's, it, it is. Yeah, it is and it isn't because of the role of alternates on this board. Oh, with the, with the alternates, that's not clear. But but in terms of that, the board can bring other people in. Like, it, like, people in, people in, like in Berlin, we often bring our town administrator in. Yeah, the reason I brought it up is that s subsequent action at the next meeting on the same topic might have an alternate uninformed by. What was done in executive session the meeting before? Sure, and that's I think that's a, a risk that we have to be aware of. Anything on anything on this document that's um, of concern or needs to be changed? Okay, not he I'm hearing anything else. Do you, do you have a, a, a clean? I have a clean copy. Perfect. Would anybody like to? Move to move to um, move, move to adopt the conflict of interest policy. Yeah, I'll move to adopt the policy and conflict of interest. Second. Okay. Any any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Okay. Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. Yeah, I've, just, I've, just, yeah, I've got the copy here. I've got the way I did it with the signature line for each town. Mm -hmm. If you find that you are supposed to be signing and you don't see a municipal name to sign over, we'll just write it in. Yeah. Okay. I might have skipped. One. So we'll we will pass pass it around the table and then um, back up. We can deposit that with you. Um, mm -hmm. You have a scanner. I do. Put that. Make that available. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, while that is going around, um, I've put an item on here, so we have only 10 minutes left, so 
Um, I wanted to, so future presentations and connections, if there was anybody else that you think we need to bring back and have a conversation with, um, you know, hopefully we will get EC Fiber to, uh, to join us at some point, although we might have to call a special meeting to do that. Um, was there anybody else that folks were interested in bringing here to, to chat? I'd like to see the mapping get started early, and so I remember someone said it was the callus rep. I've already started mapping. So, so could you could you do some early presentation to us okay. about some yeah, of the mapping? Yeah, pretty close mapping. to a pretty decent set of just, you know, the 911 data and mm -hmm. how many of my type of housing and that stuff, as well as what existing data is out there. And then what I, after that presentation, my thought is, getting some motion from the board that I can solicit the other data that's not available mm. from those organizations because Great. I think it would be better to be coming from a board position rather than a personal position. Yeah, Belco and Fairpoint will have a harder time refusing to give up their fiber maps <laughs> if, if the district wants yeah. it. Yeah, so anyway, as part of that presentation, I'd, I'd have a recommendation on that. Do you uh, want a slice of time at the next meeting? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. It may take less, but we can have dialogue too. I'd like to recommend or ask the board's permission to invite a guy from Boston who's a national expert on this, these topics. Um, can you be more specific about these topics? Yeah. Well, he's uh, Greg Whalen. His, uh, his articles are in a lot of the trade press, and he's can help us understand, I think we early on are going to need to come through the issue of open access and what it means and whether we do passive fiber or active fiber to every building in some architectural issues. So uh, I, I think, I personally think if we can keep the discussion reasonably narrow, like if he's coming up to talk about the difference between, you know, open access fiber um, versus, you know, subscriber based or like us actually providing uh, fiber to the premises or something like that, I think um, I think that, that makes sense. But having like a, a larger scale discussion, I'm not so sure that that's going to be helpful. I mean, that's obviously... I'm not you know. Oh, okay. I thought you had your hands up. So I did. Yeah. Okay. I'm and not you, sure what... You, I'm not understanding what larger scale is... Na na narrow the scope, because we could easily have a three-hour presentation that could take up an entire meeting I, I'm not sure that I that's would, useful. I'm not going to pay offer to pay him, so I don't think he's going to offer a three-hour presentation. Does, but, so does he have a presentation that's already been recorded and is available on YouTube that we can go and review and have some specific questions and have him present something specific? I mean, I've got some of his articles. I can. I'm happy to do that. Around. Yeah, bring it. Yeah. And then the question is whether to invite him up for a 20-minute presentation. But, but I, I guess what I'm getting at is. Yes, I, th I think in general we want as many pieces of data as we can get, but 20 minute presentation on what? So if we can read what he's an expert about and get a sense of sure. what's going to make the most sense that we can focus him and say, we need more information, and Greg, you have the, the best perspective on this. Let's read some of his articles, get a sense of that, and maybe at the next meeting we can decide, let's invite Greg to s present us on, okay. on so this. So don't invite him for the next meeting. Do it, let y'all decide the scope yeah. of this. So, so that we can understand better what he's bringing to the table. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, I was going to suggest Matt Dunn. Okay. To talk about? Uh, well, he, he did a lot of the Google Fiber deployment, um, mm -hmm. and I really perceive the section as being more of a, um, a lot of this being governance and less technical. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, technical piece doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and so I think he could really uh, give us some insights into like some of the municipal conditions that make for ideal deployment. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that he's now executive director of Center for Rural Innovation, really focused on finance of this stuff. I think um, so. He he could definitely address two two of those. So if, if you want to reach out to him and ask him to sort of choose narrow. Yep. just to, to, to narrow down what, what it is that he'd be presenting or a, a handful of topics and we can bring him on board, I think that would probably make sense too. What was the name again? Matt Dunn, D-U-N-N-E. Anybody else that we should be talking to? 
rich people. <laughs> How about somebody from, uh, like, will Tim Nolte still involved with Valley Net? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I so mean, somebody from Burlington Telecom has a lot of information about the struggles of serving an area that dense mm -hmm. uh, and expansion issues and stuff. I think they would have a lot to offer. I, I do have a couple of contacts at Burlington Telecom. I can reach out to them too and get a sense of, even if they just gave like a 15 minute history lesson, like um, we like I did with the EC Fiber presentation, I think that would be helpful. Also, the fact that they have, they and VTEL have the two best video packages. So th this discussion of whether we do or don't provide, aspire to provide video as part of the triple play, I think is key. Okay. I think that, that makes sense. I, I, will, I will reach out to um, Burlington Telecom and see if they're willing to do that. Okay. So, um, I put some items on what I call the, the back burner pending. Sometimes I think it's a good idea to have these list of to-do items that we haven't gotten to yet. So I will be extending this back burner with some of these things that we've talked about here. Um, I just want to go and list these. Um, we're still waiting on Barry Town's appointment. I met, mentioned this before. Orange Town is considering it. Moore Town is considering it. Um, we can get Irv and Carol to come from EC Fiber, but we will have to schedule it on a different day of the month. Um, we're still going to wait on the Business Development Committee report back, which we, I will we'll circle around to that in just a second. Um, I, I was um, contacted by somebody who is involved in Internet 2, which is a, a high-speed um, network that has a long history. I won't get into it here. They're wondering if we want to be a part of them. Unfortunately, I think the, their existing connection stops in Chittenden County which makes it a bit challenging and dubious whether we would want to move forward with that. But if you, if any of you want to look into what Internet 2 is, um, I would say just do that on your own. <clears throat> I'm happy to send you materials if you're so inclined. I don't see this as something that we can do short term. I think maybe long term there's some value there. But What's, What is it generally? Um, it's it's been around for a while, and it was one of the first like really truly high speed um, networks out there. Um, early deployments of I IPv6. They were involved in some uh, research networks around some universities. I remember in Madison, Wisconsin, there was an, one of the initial uh, deployments there um, when I was there, and it was quite a long time ago. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure that it's quite as relevant nowadays. That's my personal opinion about it. I just have a procedural question. Um, for mm -hmm. the policy, since we don't have somebody from Barrytown yet, should I write in that there's no one appointed, or do we just, just leave, leave it blank? blank. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the Rural Broadband Access Loan, Loan Guarantee, that's something that's available um, <laughs> from uh, USDA. Um, we're not going to be able to go after that um, until December, probably. But I want to let, let, let you all know that it's there. We will probably come back <laughs> to that and look at that again. I think that requires. You probably know better than I do. Fifty percent match, um, or um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a different program. There's a state program that requires a fifty percent match. This is um, this is something different. That's a clickable link in the PDF. You so. different points for what percentage match you do, oh. so that it's competitive grants. So you submit your application. Someone else has a higher proportion of grant of match, and they may win it over you. I see. Okay. It's not. When we get around to that, I know folks at USDA RD, probably Brian Doyle would be the best person, but I can verify that. Okay. And That's yeah. just build money, not planning money? Yes. Those are that's both in there. The planning money is slightly easier to achieve from the state as I as I understand it. And I have a question. The prohibition in statute on building, does that also prohibit for six months leasing? Like if if this if we wanted to get it, something lit up over leased facilities financial transactions okay so no so if you can get somebody to do it for you, for you for free and then like hand the keys off to you then we could talk about it but no we, really we can't we can't take on anything that's going to have any sort of financial exposure okay. positive or negative okay um, home stretch we're technically at nine is it okay if we go another minute or two sure Jim. I'm just, I, I, had, I had given some thought about that notion of, of um, um, we have this six-month window here. Um, you know, and I think it, 
I don't know that we should necessarily look at it as a, a, per, a complete prohibition against, you know, substantive actions on our part. It's really going to be a limitation on those who want to give us money. They're going to say, well, as long as this six-month window is open, uh, we're not going to do this because you could all just disappear tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But if someone were to accept that risk in donating us funds or mm -hmm. making funds available to us, I mean, that's, that's the risk that they're willing to take. So I don't know that we should necessarily view it as a complete prohibition to undertaking any sort of financially related transaction for the next six months. Um, just some may be willing to, you know, give us some seed money or a grant, even though that... that or, even tell us, or even tell us in six months we're going to give it this much money. We'll get, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because it takes time to get money. There's no... Yeah, yeah. Okay. We do need to be incorporated to take yourself money, though, right? We, we, exist. we exist. We exist. We are a thing. <laughs> no, we are a municipal entity, and I mean, so we, we don't have any tax ID numbers yet. But we can, you can get, get that, we can get right one now. of that, those tonight, right now. It's not hard. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, yeah. One other quick thing. I wonder if, if in our parking lot, our back burner, mm -hmm. we should include net neutrality. Okay. Uh, we are going to have to state our position eventually mm -hmm. on that. Um, if for no other reason than just marketing, but we might start thinking about it now. So as a net neutrality uh, policy what, document? Yeah. What does it mean to them? Okay. What, what are we offering? Okay. Does that seem like something, uh, I mean, it's, this is still germane to the discussion, does that seem like that policy is something that should go to the policy bylaws? Maybe committee? someday. Okay. I think, but I think we should talk about it generally because I think this is also going to get into the marketing area. I think that's going to be one of our strongest Okay. So it's frankly, so especially because we have a state around us. So, um, so um, task um, a net neutrality policy or a, a statement of principles to the policy and bylaws committee um, with sort of open-ended deadline. Well, why don't we have somebody come and talk to us about net neutrality? Who's mm -hmm. been involved in the issue? And just who, who would you like? I don't know. I haven't. Dabble in that issue for a while. I don't know who's current. I'd recommend Lauren Glenn to video. Oh, Lauren? Good. Who's going to reach out to Lauren? I don't know, Senator. Next. Okay. <laughs> Get him to come see me. Can I add a, propose some add ons to your Please back do. 40 list? Yeah. Uh, the relationship to the 10 year plan. Because, in effect, what we're going to be doing is writing the central Vermont piece of the 10 year plan. <laughs> Telecommunications plan. That's a statute under BSA two hundred two C and D. I'd ask y'all to look at that. Jeremy quoted from a piece of two hundred two C that I yeah. have. And then our relationship or possible interface or facilitation of public safety priorities, like cell coverage in Woodbury or microcells. So. Yeah, I think that is also going to piggyback a bit on that demand aggregation piece, looking at where we're going to build. But I think, yeah, it's like that strategic vision, that's got to come into that discussion next next meeting, next month. Well, the public safety, there's a big public safety initiative moving, and whether we provide some uh, guidance or support for that with between Capital Fire Mutual Aid and Central Vermont Public Safety Agency, uh, that's the meeting I came from okay. to get here. So, so I, I will put public safety priorities on the list of the back burner items that we still need to chew on. I thought it was going to get addressed in our committee, but can we bulk up our committee so that we can that's, meet? Yeah, as, 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 soon as, as soon as we talk about what the, um, um, what the committees are going to be doing and the additional <laughs> stuff, um, yeah, I think we should add at least two more people to each committee. So otherwise, I mean... The three-person committee just doesn't make sense. Um, and is there anything else that needs to go to committee or that we need to discuss that we need to bring up sooner than later? Hopefully, a lot, a lot more stuff will come out of the our larger um, policy discussion at our next meeting, our vision discussion, I should say. Once we know what our vision is, then that can. <clears throat> give us some good marching orders to continue from there. Okay. Um, we've got minutes from the May 8th meeting. Um, 
I'd like to, um, anybody would like to move to approve those? Can I, can I suggest what? that until we decide on them? I was going to move to a document so we can at least discuss it. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay. I'll move we adopt the minutes uh, of the last meeting. Okay. So. <clears throat> Second by. Uh, I think the fact that we're doing them on the letterhead, which is lovely and all, and I appreciate the initiative, but it had, it seems to have a a decision on a name and a decision on a purpose and stuff that we haven't arrived at yet. Okay. And so I would just ask that we put our minutes on paper instead of letterhead until such a time. Okay. So, I mean, it's on the Facebook page also with that logo and with that name. So can we... It does our name for now. What's the name? Central Vermont Internet. It's well, that's what we filed, isn't it? Yeah. So um, the concern is that we're putting it on this letterhead looking document that I, that I put together um, where, where that might not be totally appropriate. Does anybody else share this concern? Well, I, I, how, can you, how can you have minutes without saying who met? I don't quite get this. Uh, you're just saying without a logo? Is that we what you're could saying? take the yeah. logo yeah, off. Yeah, just, the take the logo just take the logo off. Just say Central Vermont Internet. Internet. Uh, meeting I, June 12th. It's a placeholder logo. It's not bad. And we'll evolve and we'll change it. So I don't really care. Okay. I would, I would submit really too that the use of the word draft strongly suggests that nothing on there is permanent. <laughs> <laughs> In those really big letters that go across the page. Mm -hmm. You saw them too. <laughs> they were hard. They were hard to see. Wow. <laughs> I move that we put the draft watermark on the logo. But it's always clear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't move with these. Yeah, motion on the floor. No, 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 Contents of this look look okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I had a little trouble finding figuring out recalling what the purpose of our sub of our committee was supposed to do from the minutes. I, uh, yeah, it says uh, motion by people to establish the bylaws and policy committee with the following charges. And yeah, I, no, I, I'm talking about the other committee. Um, Establish the Business Development Committee to talk about the name or DBA, the research, finance, and org structures, establishing talking points. Yeah, I thought, as I recall, there was something about market development sectors or something. That was not, I, I have my original notes from that. That was not among okay. the things that we, I mean, and you can feel free to go back to the, to the tape or the okay. video. Um, that was not something that I remember seeing there. Okay. Any further discussion about the minutes uh, as presented? Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, one, one abstention. You were not here, so. Um, unanimous. One abstention. Roxbury, rep. Okay. Um, Roundtable. We all had like uh, raw statements last time around. If there's anything else that you want to add uh, in, in parting, um, I'll start with you, Mr. Greenbaum, and swing back around. Otherwise, you can just say pass. Thank you, everyone. Phil? I'm tired. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I, just a, real quick, I, I'm very used to working with decision points and, and we were talking about for instance with the vision and things so I, I tended to get a little uncomfortable when we start talking about doing something without coming up with some idea of when we want to bring it to a close that's just round table stuff. Okay. No. Yes. 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 Bob? Anything to say for the round table? I'm tired. <laughs> no, it's, it's haying season. Here's what I've been doing all day. <laughs> 
I believe it. Oh. I got Tractor back to prove it. I'd like to say thank you to our clerk for her work. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I mean, when we do an agenda, I'd like to know which I, what items are action items. So in terms of describing okay. the agenda, that should be on there. So is that the minutes exactly. are written, we know that this item had an action. And then, so so you. vote vote likely or something like that, yes. or action item, and does that satisfy your, are you, are you interested, is that different? No, from no, it's different. It's, it's more of saying we're going to come to a conclusion by Okay, so de day. deadlines. <laughs> Establishing deadlines. Okay. Hmm. So then you want actions also whether they were on the agenda or not noted in the minutes. Sure. See you next month. Great. <laughs> he sent Jeremy an email that he can decide whether or not he wants to disseminate that should inspire us all. It's about an English farmer in the countryside of Lancashire who got tired of British Telecom. She bought a kilometer of fiber and installed it with her neighbors with her tractor. And, uh, <laughs> B4RN? Is that, is that that initiative? Yes. Or brought in for the rural north. That was yeah. one of the initiatives that actually inspired me to, see, to seek this out. I, I read it and I dreamed of digging a trench yeah, down into town. And what I thought, and I actually told this to, um, I did a podcast interview, I actually said, and that's the sort of thing that could work in Vermont. Like somebody just getting, getting their trencher and just running it back. So Bob's got a tractor. We know that. We do. Yeah, that's right. So, can everybody sign in? But we can't buy the trencher for six months. I don't know. I'll cover it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Give me your wallet. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Silo to silo. 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 Silo to sil